At Humana, our Medicare Advantage plans give you coverage and care you can count on, along with guided support to help you feel your best. You could have a plan with a $0 premium or an all-in-one plan that may include medical and prescription coverage, as well as routine dental, vision, and hearing. Learn more at GetHumana.com. Humana, a more human way to healthcare. Humana is a Medicare Advantage HMO and PPO organization with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in any Humana plan depends on contract renewal. That I really, I don't even th- know how to introduce this young man. He, uh, I think he sent me five emails over the weekend. He was just ready to talk to you. His name is Lars Larson. He's ready to go. You can catch him today at four, but uh, this is Lars Unleashed, Uncensored, and uh, Raring to Go. Good morning, sir. Hi, good morning, Kevin. How are you? Well, I just, I try to, I tell people that First Amendment Fridays don't end my week. My week just keeps on going. Uh, my granddaughter was with us this weekend, and she's a joy, but you know, when she's busy or asleep or whatever, I, I do prep for the show. If you don't do prep for the show, heck, you're not ready. No, I, I'm with you. Um, there's a, a big one that I'm going to get to at the end of this segment, but first, okay. where would you like to begin, Boise State getting the national news or somewhere else? We could go to Boise State because that's very much front and center uh, about protecting children and protecting young ladies, uh, first of all, and protect them from what? We want them to have all the opportunities. But when you say, if you want to take part in athletic competition at high school or college, uh, tell your daughters, tell your granddaughters, uh, they may end up, because of woke DEI politics, they may end up competing against biological males. And there, while all sports, I think, have the uh, have the uh, possibility of injury, when you put biological females up against biological males who call themselves female, uh, you have a much greater potential for injury. If you don't believe me, look up the video of the woman at the Olympics, not an American, but the woman at Olymp- in the Olympics getting punched in the face by a biological male who says he, he identifies as female, but he's got the muscles of a guy. He punched her in the face, knocked her to the canvas, and she just dropped out of competition. And we've seen other, there's one young lady who was a volleyball player and was injured so badly she had to drop out of, not just drop out of that competition, drop out of competing in sports at all because the ball hit her so hard in the face that uh, it did permanent damage to her. Now imagine your daughter or granddaughter being in that situation. You say, well, sometimes sports go wrong. You know, you can have injuries in skiing and horseback riding and basketball, football. I mean, you know, football, contact sport, basketball, not as much of a contact sport, but still somewhat of a contact sport. But when you put men up against women, there is a physical difference between the two that apparently Democrats and liberals want to ignore. And when they ignore it, it may be literally at the peril of the young ladies in your family. Now, are Americans going to put up with that? Is Boise State going to put up with that? Well, I, I wonder if Boise State had Tell a choice. Tell people the details but, of what, what right, happened but, there. because Right, but before yeah. I get to that, because our, our governor, yeah. that a lot of people may or may not like, uh, he was the first in the nation to sign the Protect Women in Sports Act. Riley Gaines showed up. Uh, obviously, we see her all over the place. She did a big rally. Then they had another executive order. So Idaho has been at the forefront here. States have copied our legislation protecting biological women against biological men competing in this. So Boise State being a state university, they decided to be in compliance with the governor's order, and this is my take on it, that they would forfeit a game against San Jose State because you have a person at San Jose State that was a man and now is playing as a woman. And that's the speculation. Boise State did not confirm that. Boise State said we're canceling the game and didn't really give anything else. Everybody and else. Why inclu- not confirm it? You're a public institution. You take money from the taxpayers. There's a law to be complied with. The law is aimed not at something esoteric, but at protecting the safety of young ladies. Why would Boise State stay silent when they could say, we are doing this in compliance with the law, number one, number two, but number one, to protect the safety of young women on our campus? I would think the college would want to do that. Well, Boise State has had a long, nefarious history of embracing the the liberal agenda. And Boise State has a problem. It has had a problem in the past with conservatives. They recently lost a lawsuit involving I Big I saw the, the $4 million to the coffee shop. Serves them right. 
yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. That they had to pay four million because they, they they opposed a coffee shop that was just doing things that were pro police. Yeah, well, there and again. Lars, you know this because you're an international businessman. You deal with people at the highest yeah. levels. No, I, I'm serious about this. Oh. They're going to appeal that, you know, they should have settled. Uh, it drove the woman out of business. Local lady that had dedicated herself 30 years to serving people uh, went to this, lo- you know, institution, local business. And you had a lot of woke kids decided to run her in the university. You know, again, the court found them liable. So, And they should have been just yeah. like. Uh, what was it, uh, Oberlin College, that uh, that that went to war with a local bakery shop that had been there, I think, for a long time, and uh, the bakery shop kept having theft problems, and they finally identified some of the thieves, and the college declared it racist because the thieves happened to be people of color, and the college badmouthed them, and they and it hurt the business badly, and the badly sued over uh, the uh, bakery. Uh, served, uh, you know, uh, served them with a lawsuit, and they won. And I think they got it was tens of millions of dollars because it was such an outrageous case. And when these public institutions start to go to war with society itself, when you know, when they say we don't really want to comply with this law, so we we just won't tell anybody why we forfeited the game, is that serving the public? Or do you ever? I understand that when it's a, 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 a say a personnel issue, you fired somebody from your college uh, uh, over personnel matters that are required by law and sometimes by contract to de- be private. I still don't have to like it, but I understand why. But in this case, this this is complying with a state law and trying to keep young ladies secret. Are they afraid to say that out loud? Well, dealing with the liberal NCAA, I would say they would. I think the stage has already been crossed off the list of having any big-time collegiate activities because of the law. Well, would you send your kids – and now Boise State's better because of that law than a lot of colleges in a lot of America where they just simply ignore the issue altogether. And if the young ladies get hurt, too bad. Or if they lose – now, Kevin – um, I joked with my producer. I said somebody should make a, a comedy movie, sort of in line with uh, what a Dodgeball or one of those, about some coach who takes over a failing team. And I even said women's volleyball, and said when he takes it over, he's told, you know, you're, this is your last stop as a coach. You've, you've fallen from <laughs> the heights down down to the depths. You're now coaching women's volleyball, and this is maybe a guy who's been disparaging of women's sports altogether. And they said, you don't have a job after this if you don't, you know, win. So he goes out and, and recruits a bunch of, of ringers in the form of, say, failed male basketball players. Say, hey, you want your scholarship to continue? Come over and play volleyball for me and just say you identify as women. And, uh, and except in this, it's not funny when, when young ladies get hurt, either physically hurt or hurt by being forced out of competition, forced to finish third or fourth or fifth because a biological male beat them. And, Kevin, you and I both know the numbers. You know, it's nothing against women that women can't compete with men in many of the physical, uh, you know, athletic pursuits. And the the number I like to use is that men beat the the four-minute mile time in the 1950s, and they are now well under the four, when I say well under, 10 or 12 or 15 seconds under the four-minute mile. But the four-minute mile was a big deal at the time. And women are still not even close. I think they're at 4.09. I don't follow track and field that closely, but it's a very definitive way to say, are you saying that women cannot compete against men in, in many athletic, maybe not all, but many athletic pursuits? And the answer is yes. Women have never run as fast as men, and based on the history of about the last 70 or 80 years, they may never run as fast as men. Men will always run a bit faster. So is it fair, then, to make women compete in track and field versus biological males who say, I identify as a girl? Well, and then you wonder where the feminists are. Well, they're nowhere. They've they've absented themselves. Along, have you have you noticed all the feminists who came forward to criticize Donald Trump? You know who's got a history. That's fine. How about Doug Emhoff? Doug Emhoff, the husband of Kamala Harris, 
you know, who had her own stupid stuff this weekend down at the border. But Emhoff comes to the Northwest, and he gave a speech in Portland. And, of course, all the legacy media are saying, oh, he gave this impassioned speech about women's reproductive rights. Do you know what I would have asked him? Was your view on women's reproductive rights uh, directed or, or informed at all by the fact that in your first marriage you got the nanny pregnant? Nobody likes it when you get the nanny pregnant. Well, and his first wife didn't like it. No. His, his marriage ended. And now Kamala Harris, who has her own history of, you know, getting her first two positions in uh, politics, to be blunt, on her back. Uh, you know, first two jobs she got were because her boyfriend, Willie Brown, got them for her. And they, Kevin, think about this. Her first position on a commission was given to her by Willie Brown 30 years ago, and she made 120 grand a year by serving on that commission. I mean, that, 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 that would be good money today. It was really good money back then. Yeah, that, that's back when 120 grand was really popping. Actually, it was real money. <laughs> was really popping. But, but, you know, does anybody ask Kamala Harris about that? The fact that, would you advise young ladies to, take, to get into politics the way you did, Vice President Harris? Ooh, wow. Well, you now, know, it's all about working at McDonald's. Yeah, well, oh, and that, do you know, do you know why, and one of my favorite writers is, is Derek Hunter, um, who's, uh, 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 Derek Smith, I'm sorry, Derek Smith is married to one of my former producers, great, one of the best producers in America, uh, Heather, used to be Heather Smith, now it's Heather Hunter, but Derek wrote a piece this weekend, so I'll give him credit, but he, he made the point, why is it important that she's lying about McDonald's, and she apparently is lying through her teeth about working a job at McDonald's. Well, you know, okay, who cares? She, so what? Here's what's the so what. She wanted to somehow show that she grew up as a lower to middle class kid. She did not. And Kevin, yeah, I think you and I have talked about this. So when you try to present yourself falsely to the public, should you be called out for it? So she says, oh, I worked at McDonald's like everybody else. Kevin, you and I both run into people who say, hey, Lars, do you remember when I was one of your interns? Or do you remember when we worked together? I worked at a furniture store when I was 14. If somebody worked at McDonald's with Kamala Harris, do you think, at, you know, way back in the day, do yeah. you think they'd, and she's now running for president of the United States, she is vice president, do you think they'd remember Oh, yeah, I, I used I, to work with her. No, I agree with you. but and then uh, just to dovetail, Nobody remembers her. Right, but just to dovetail on that, by the way, our great friend Lars Larson joining us, Kevin Miller, it, it, the weird on KIDO Talk Radio, it, the, the weirdest thing about this is she never mentions her dad, and her mom and dad were married. Oh. Yeah. yeah, well, and her dad was a Stanford University professor who, as I told you, when she claims to be a middle-class kid, her dad's paycheck at, at the time was twenty grand a year, which sounds like minimum wage today. But back then, twenty grand was more than twice as much as the median income in America. And her mom was a cancer researcher, so she made a good paycheck. I can't find out what her paycheck was, but her dad was getting paid twenty grand a year to be a professor at Stanford University. And they did not live in Oakland. She was born in Oakland because that's where the hospital is. It'd be like somebody from you know some other part of well except it's not the same but if you said oh i was born in boise well you're that doesn't mean you grew up in boise you might be from uh, you might be from uh, from sandpoint you might be from uh, coeur d'alene but you know if the hospital is there so she was born in a hospital in oakland which is very blue collar community was then is now but she grew up in Berkeley. And do you know why she doesn't want to say she grew up in Berkeley? And then she doesn't at all want to mention that, well, for about half a dozen years, she lived in Canada and went to high school and graduated from high school in Canada. Because it doesn't make her sound very middle class and it doesn't make her sound very um, American. You know, and I'm not going to debate her citizenship. She has born in America citizenship, then she can run for president because she was born in America and her parents were here legally. But her dad's family own slaves in Jamaica. So she comes from a slave holding family. She was not, she did not grow up in Oakland, California. She did not grow up a middle class kid. She went to a private high school, did I, or a private uh, kindergarten. Did I tell you this last week, Kevin? No, Lars. Back in the day, there's a school called the Berkwood School in Berkeley. And it's where the rich people send their kids for kindergarten. Now, 
you know, don't let anybody drive off the road when they hear this. But today, if you, I couldn't find out how much it cost to send little Kamala Harris to private kindergarten back in the day. Today, that school is $29,000 a year for freaking kindergarten. Well, that's more than romper room. Let me uh, let, hold on, Lars. Let me <laughs> let me jump in here. Our great friend Lars Larson, because we have a, a limited amount of time, we want to get a couple of other things. Okay, uh, go your for thoughts it. on on the border and what the vice president was wearing and why it's so important. Well, I, I just point out that if you're going to visit the American border, do you wear a necklace that costs more than the average man or woman makes at a job in America today? She wore a $60,000 necklace to the border. But the more important, and that just shows bad judgment. It just, it just, she has no judgment. She, and she has no clue about what average Americans deal with. That's problem number one. Problem number two, Friday, and I got the info in time to talk about it, although I'll talk about it more today. Friday, we find out from Customs and Border Protection, uh, Tony Gonzalez, a member of Congress, pried this information loose for them. How many convicted criminals has Joe Biden told his Border Patrol to release into America in the last three and a half years? Kevin, take a guess. Oh, I, I can't even try. 450,000. And if you say, well, Lars, that was, they were probably writing bad checks or something. No. How about 18,000 murderers, convicted murderers? Now, on top of the 450,000 convicted criminals that Customs and Border Patrol knowingly released into America, there are another 222,000 accused criminals, people accused of murder and rape and assault and serious crimes. So you've got a total of about 650,000 either accused or convicted criminals in three years, Kevin. Now, imagine what you, even a country as big as ours with 340 million people, imagine what, it, what, what effect you have on that country when you release two thirds of a million convicted and or accused criminals. And you say, well, hold on, why'd they release them? Because Biden wants them in the country and he doesn't want to turn them back. Now, if you tried to apply to come into the United States as a uh, uh, the legal way, um, and you said, oh, by the way, I'm a convicted murderer, I imagine your chances might not go to zero, but it'd be pretty close to zero that we're going to say, well, fine, come on down. You're welcome to come in. We would turn away people like that because we don't even want people uh, in this country, and, and this is when I say we don't want, it's written into the law. We don't want people who are even likely to end up on welfare and food stamps. It's called the public charge rule or law, and it's in federal law. And it says you have to show, if you want to immigrate to the United States, you have to show that you are unlikely, there's no way to guarantee it, unlikely to become a, a public charge. And what that language means in the law, unlikely to end up on welfare, food stamps, Section 8, Medicaid, all the poverty programs. Why? If you come to America... We don't want you to be, a, you know, we want you to add to what's here in America. We don't want you to take away. And if you come in and you say, well, I'm immediately going to sign up for welfare and food stamps and all that good stuff, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cost you, it's like, it'd be like a family in Boise whose daughter falls in love with a total deadbeat or, or son who falls in love with a total deadbeat. It could go either way. And Boise say, so could, what, yeah. is, what, what, is, what does your fiancé do for a living? Well, she doesn't work. <clears throat> Well, has she ever worked? No. Right. Did she finish high school? No. Uh, she, she's kind of a deadbeat. So in other words, everybody else in the family is productive in one way or another, and you're going to add a, an unproductive member to the family. Uh, does that seem like a good idea? No. I'm not saying that everybody who comes into a family has to be out there. No, I, I'm with you, Lars. I, day, but, yeah, Lars, I, I got, you a got another question. No, I got I two more. I thought we love you, and that's why we love having you on, but... Uh, and usually I, I have nothing, so I'm trying to add something to our segment with our great friend Lars Larson. You bring a lot, Kevin. A a anyway, let me get to, to you on this one. So we have the big debate. How do you think it's going to play out? What's your prediction, sir? Uh, uh, well, at this point, maybe they're trying to lower expectations, but Tim Wall's staffers are apparently saying he doesn't like the fact. Tim Walls does not like the fact that he's going to have to debate J.D. Vance. He says, you know, this, this college-educated lawyer type. I, now, maybe all they're trying to do is diminish expectations, and then if he does halfway well, then it'll be viewed as a win. But I think I think J.D. Vance is going to eat, uh, you know, uh, eat uh, Tim Walls, tampon Tim, for lunch. 
you know, if if and especially Vance is sharp, is sharp and he's and he's smart um, and he's well informed. And Walls just keeps sticking his foot in it. Remember when he uh, about ten days ago he he, he said that uh, you know Kamala Harris worked as a, a big part of her career as a uh, as a, uh, a prostitutor. <laughs> you know those kind of mistakes are not going to go down well. She was a prosecutor. But the you know there there you know I I think it was a Freudian slip frankly because she she did prostitute herself to get her first couple of jobs in politics so yeah you know when when J D Vance goes up against Tampon Tim and and it, it, even if the moderators do what they did in the last debate between Trump and uh, and Kamala Harris and they give all the easy questions to Harris and and just you know fact check J D J D Vance to the nth degree. Uh, he's. I think Walls is going to have a tough time. He he comes off as a buffoon. Mm-hmm. You know, he likes to brag that he was a coach. He wasn't. He couldn't be coached because he had a criminal record, <laughs> and nobody wants to mention that. He put tampon machines in the boys' bathrooms in Minnesota. He pretended to be a conservative in his congressional district when he was in Congress, and he he actually had a good rating from the NRA and all the rest of this. But he was pretending to be something. And when he was in the the National Guard questions are going to come up, when he ran around for two decades and claimed to be a a retired command sergeant major, and he wasn't. Right. One final question for Lars Larson, the big one to represent our friend Bob Novak. God rest his soul. Okay, Lars, uh, the FCC has just approved uh, George Soros buying Odyssey. You're on all these stations across the country. Are are we looking? And and then, you know, then we hear that he might be buying this parent company as well. Uh, he's on a wow. buying spree. Uh, what do you make of uh, Soros controlling one of the larger radio groups in America? And that's Odyssey, who had uh, like 220 stations out of 13,000, but out of about 2,500 spoken word stations. Yeah. Spoken word meaning news talk, news, and sports talk are the are the single biggest spoken word, single biggest format in radio. It's about a quarter of all the radio stations. He just bought 10% of it. I always assume that whatever George Soros is doing has a political agenda attached to it. He isn't just saying, let's buy these things. They might be a good investment. <laughs> we'll make some money. Right. He's doing it. He's doing it out of a political motive. And his political motivation, just to back that up for people who aren't familiar with George Soros and his links to the World Economic Forum, this guy has helped to elect DAs throughout America, district attorneys, who just ignore the law and say, I'm not going to prosecute people for serious crimes. That's a problem. Because Soros and his liberal buddies wanted to change the laws, and they couldn't get the laws changed the way they would did. So they said, well, why bother changing the laws? Why don't we just change the people who apply the laws? And the result has been Chicago. The result has been L.A., George Gascon, uh, Kim Fox in Chicago, um, Mike Schmidt for Brains in Portland, who just got bumped out by the voters, thank God. But... But his agenda has always been political. So if he's buying the stations, it's out of a political agenda. What could he do at that point? He could say, we're not going to carry conservative talk. He could. Now, he'd be totally, <laughs> he'd be taking his little investment and running it to, because of you, there is no other talk but conservative talk. A liberal talk's been tried. It's gone bankrupt every time it's been tried. People don't want to listen to that nonsense. And I'm, I mean, if you say, well, Lars, that's just your opinion. No. Well, yeah. the, the marketplace... They they have pumped millions, uh, bought tens of millions of dollars into liberal talk, and it doesn't work. There are a few individuals like Tom Hartman that are somewhat successful, but the rest of it died multiple times. And conservative talk has become the dominant format in America. What does that tell you about America? Well, no, I'm America's with you, Lars. Center right country. I'm with you. Uh, quickly, ten seconds. What do you yep. make of this? If he does it, what's he, what's he going to do? Uh, I think he will start to mess with the formats. Now, whether that will make a difference in the next, you know, 30 days, 35 days, I don't think so. But is his agenda to clamp down on free speech? Yeah. Play play the soundbite later for your audience from John Kerry saying this First Amendment thing gets in the way of effective governance. Talk about frightening words from a former presidential candidate, not a good one, but a former presidential candidate, former secretary of state and professional gas bag who specializes at marrying rich women. And on that note, Lars, we got to run overtime today. We appreciate you, brother. Hey, I appreciate you. Take care. Thank you, Lars Larson. Your call's next. Kevin Miller. And star, Dennis, good morning. Good morning, Kevin. It's so good to hear your voice. Um, I wanted to comment about the girls' uh, volleyball team. Yes, sir. 
They uh, not only are all stars in my book, but they deserve an A for anatomy, A for psychology, an A in finance because they know when to waste, they're wasting their money, and A for leadership. And let's hope this gives an example to the rest of the world that San Luis Obispo really stands for slow. Thank you. All right, Dennis, thank you for the call. Your comments more coming up next. Kevin Rill in the morning, KIDO Talk Radio. Two. Phone numbers here, 580-5436-580-KIDO. We'll go back to volleyball in a minute. We'll explain the do's and the don'ts. Concerning Boise State's decision to uh, not play the game against San Jose State, remember, and we have that story for you on our website, KIDOTalkRadio.com, you remember that the bottom line is they didn't say why they, they, they did this. They just said they canceled it. And you have speculation from folks at OutKick, um, the Daily Wire, the Daily Caller, and others saying it was because you have a man who was born a man, now he's a woman playing for San Jose State. Uh, your calls are welcome on that issue. We can go on and on about that. Also, your thoughts on the big VP debate. And we've asked you to pray for our friends east of the Great River on the East Coast trying to re- respond and revive and recover from Hurricane Helene. Over the weekend, Saturday Night Live came back, and uh, what uh, an issue. It's very rare we'll give you this clip this is long, but uh, Joe Biden, remember when you say Joe Biden. Joe Biden. It is Joe Biden, right? That's how we pronounce his name. Joe Biden. Well, the folks at Saturday Night Live, they have a different way of pronouncing his name, and it was the return of Dana Carvey. You remember him from his days as George H.W. Bush, Maya Rudolph, also as Kamala Harris. And it was the cold open. Now, the cold open is there's no this, there's no that. It's just right to it as if it's something. So what we're going to hear is Kamala Harris interviewing or introducing Joe Biden and Dana Carvey. I mean, if they had been playing this for the last six months, well, I think Trump would be up by 10. Let's take a listen. Up, everyone. Just in case you missed it. We couldn't have gotten here without one man. And his name is Joe Biden. <laughs> Get on out here, Joe Biden. <laughs> Folks, that's right. A lot of people who forget I'm president, including me. But guess what? And by the way, I think I did a pretty good job. I passed more bills than any president in history. But folks, we still got work to do, no joke. I'm being serious right now. Come on. And guess what? And by the way, the fact of the matter is, the rich don't pay their fair share. They got to pay their fair share. We got to build back better. The build back the better, the better, the better, the better. Build back the better. Can't, can't believe it's not better. Thank you, Biden. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, again, here you have Dana Carvey doing Joe Biden better than Joe Biden. And we have Maya Rudolph playing Kamala Harris. And she's trying to get him off the stage like what happened in real life. Real life is actually pales in comparison to this portrayal. But the bottom line here is this actually, I, I, I mean, they're really showing us, we're all laughing at this, but this actually happened. And this is what's going on. And this is the great cover-up, right? When you have somebody who's just not all there, now that's okay if they're, you know, the, the guy in the corner. But if they're the leader of the free world... Thank you, Joe Biden. Thank you for putting country first and for handing over the reins. I didn't want to. (laughs) They made me. And guess what? And by the way, (laughs) the fact of the matter is, no joke. This is serious right now. This is serious. Anyway, in conclusion, me and Vice President Harris are the same. Oh, okay. Ha ha. Great stuff. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, Joe. There we have it, uh, the takeaways, Joe Biden, Joe Biden, so hilarious. And you got to go, Joe. We're the same. Nope, you got to go, Joe. 
it's time for you to go. Just like we saw in real life. Just like we saw and just what, as we witnessed, the open primary didn't happen. If you're a Democrat, and we all get that the Democrats want to win. We all get that the Democrats, I mean, have you ever wanted so much, so so fast, so this, so that, that you're willing to do anything? Again, pardon me for a, a, a crazy, wacky, zany story. Ten years ago, we did the victory tour. Ten years ago, Mrs. Miller and I went to a place called Nashville, Tennessee. And as you can tell by my portly physique, I love the food. I love the food. The food is great. The food is wonderful. And so if you have ever had White Castle burgers, and you can get those burgers at any place, but it's a predominantly northeast kind of thing, maybe a little the Midwest. They're salty. They're this. They're that. They're amazing. And so there's a place in the south called Crystal's. And it didn't matter where Crystal's was. It was, again, they're burgers like, they're burgers like what you've had, uh, from White Castle. And I, and I'm just sitting there going, this is, this is great. And, and I would do anything for a White Castle Crystal's burger. And I just lost perspective. I go, oh, eat, eat, eat. That's the way the Democrats are with this, this campaign. They know. That if people just look at things in an objective way, uh, it doesn't really make sense. Nobody voted for her. Nobody voted for her. Remember the Democrats when Barack Obama was running wild? Thanks, Obama. Yeah, Barack Obama was running wild. And the chickens were coming home to roost. America's chickens coming home to roost. Great enunciation there from Reverend Wright. However... They wanted to get rid of the, the, the real people from voting. They called them superdelegates. Superdelegates! Liberal! They didn't, they don't trust the people. This is their wonderful dream coming to fruition because nobody wanted her. Six months ago, everybody thought she was not a smart person. Today, they pulled the coup on Joe. Didn't want to go. They did. But, but therefore, I am. They pulled a coup. The Democrats didn't vote for this person. And now, not only are they trying to sell her as something, and a lot of people, with sorry, sorry to say this, are stupid. They're buying the act. I mean, who would you like to hang out with for a night? Minnesota Waltz? That can tell you fake stories about being in the Army National Guard? Kamala, who Lars Larson described her ascent to power? J.D. Vance, self-made guy, Donald Trump, an inspiration? At least we can say that our candidate is not Gavin Newsom in a flannel shirt. Yeah, yeah Tim's been a complete disaster in Minnesota. And uh, what's happened is he's so good at being this folksy, nice, kind of down-to-earth guy until people get to know him and his policies. I, I don't know if you know this, but his old congressional district where he played this character for several years of being kind of a, a folksy, ag-friendly outdoorsman, uh, he lost it in both of his gubernatorial races in the last one almost by 10 points. Uh, he's not well-liked because once you get to know the real Tim Walls, uh, he's like Gavin Newsom in a flannel shirt. I, I... He's Gavin Newsom in a flannel shirt. 580-5436, 580-KIDO. Kevin Miller, KIDO Talk Radio. He's so good at being this folksy, nice, kind of down-to-earth guy until people get to know him and his policies. I, I don't know if you know this, but his old congressional district where he played this character for several years of being kind of a, a folksy, ag-friendly outdoorsman, he lost it in both of his gubernatorial races in the last one almost by 10 points. Uh, he's not well-liked because once you get to know the real Tim Walls, uh, he's like Gavin Newsom in a flannel shirt. I... I <laughs> from ABC's liberal ABC's this week with Martha Raddatz, Kevin Miller in the morning, KIDO talk radio. So uh, <laughs> we're reacting to Joe Biden, Joe Biden from Saturday Night Live. We're reacting to Tim Waltz. He's a disaster. He's a disaster. And we all know he's a disaster. And the economy is a disaster. And here we have Nancy Pelosi saying, the economy's great. Speaking of the 2024 election, there are a lot of independent and conservative voters 
who don't necessarily love Trump. They're not Trump loyalists, but they are voting for him because they feel like Democrats haven't done a good enough job tackling inflation, tackling immigration. Well, they haven't. And you hear this person. I believe this is on public television. Taxpayer supported state sanction like Pravda public television. Imagine that. And it'd be great if they would have, you know, our perspective on point counterpoint. But I'm sitting here looking at this and they're asking Nancy Pelosi. They're almost apologizing for the question. Yesterday, I was at one of my favorite places to hang out. Now, a lot of you for the crew uh, over here, I'm sure it's watching television, playing games, golfing, swimming, whatever. For me, it's going to the supermarket. There was somebody in front of me, and maybe they were shopping for the family. 300 bucks, And I'm thinking, dude, I hope that lasts you a month. 300 bucks, and you're thinking, they're doing a good job on the economy? So much so that you have Albertsons wanting to be swallowed up by Kroger because Kroger can get them better prices. Hopefully, it's better life for the workers. Come on, man. There's no way. At 580-5436-580-KIDO. Think about that for a moment. And they're saying, you know, she's apologizing. Apologize to the people that are working five jobs and still can't make it. But I will say this. Uh, we have done the best job of tackling inflation that any developed country. And it is down low now, so low that the chairman of the Fed could lower the interest rates. Uh, we did a great job. And I think that we have to do better in communicating that. Yeah, thank you, Madam Nancy. You know, some people call their wives Miss Terry, Miss This, Miss That, Miss Nancy. No, it's Miss Pelosi. A good job on the economy for who? Yeah, for people that are, you know, addicted to the stock market. Stock market's great for the working people, for the people that want to buy a house. You did a lousy job, horrible job. God rest his soul, he's still alive. Jimmy Carter is going to be 100 years old tomorrow. This is making the Carter economy seem Competent. More on that in a minute. Well, again, this should be a nonpartisan issue from everybody about Joe Biden. They did a great job on the economy. For whom? That's Nancy Pelosi. I watched the Sunday shows. I don't know why. But they were going, why is J.D. Vance so unpopular? Why are they? Why are? Why is J, Why do people not like J.D. Vance? Well, let's look at the media coverage. When 95% of the coverage is negative, you're going to have a negative perception. It's not like Minnesota Waltz is running away with it. He's not. But it's the difference between working in a place that likes you or working in a place where you have support or working in a place where they're like, here you go, buddy. You know how it is. We've all been to business meetings where, you know, everything is a place. Everything is good to go. You don't have to work as hard because you have the infrastructure and you have people that that have your back. You know, life, we we would love life to be objective, but it's very subjective on uh, on the ideas of success and failures. And and then here we have, you know, Gavin Newsom in a flannel shirt, horrible record with the military, horrible record with the economy. I guess he's a nice guy. I I, I guess he could be Gavin Newsom. No, he couldn't be Gavin Newsom's daddy because Gavin Newsom's in his mid-50s. He's like the relatable Gavin Newsom. Gavin Newsom's the good-looking dude. Hey, man, uh, one wife was a prosecutor, could have been a model, or was a model, second wife, very attractive. I'm sure she's very intelligent. Uh, Looks were secondary for them. And then you got Waltz, who's like who we really are. There's Waltz hanging out, you know, (laughs) at the sporting goods section because he's a sportsman. Really? As people are introduced to Tim Walls and understand that this guy is uh, for free health care, a free college tuition, uh, he's given driver's licenses to illegals, uh, thousands, as we have now learned from ICE, are rapists and murderers who are in this country. Uh, He wants an open border just like Kamala Harris. These two are both soft on crime and soft on the border. Yeah, I would call him Mr. Softy. I am back east today, but... um... Uh, anytime I get an opportunity to engage with my good friends in Idaho, it's a great day. So, great day today. Uh, an incredible day. Uh, so, I take it you watched the debate last night? I got to see most of it. I didn't get all of it, but I got to see enough to pretty much validate in my mind what 
what went on and what I it was exactly what I, I thought would probably go on. And so, uh, interesting, interesting debate, Kevin. Well, Congressman Fulcher, it's, and again, you've worked closely with the president. You've worked closely with those big dogs in the Republican Party. And for a lot of us that are just fans and voters, obviously very important, but uh, we don't get the behind-the-scenes things. You could see why, despite the criticism from people within the party and outside the party, that Donald Trump picked J.D. Vance. I, you could. And I've heard... I've heard um, uh, people say that, that know him better than me. I do not know uh, Mr. Vance. I, I, I know, of course, Mr. Trump, and I know what his mindset is, but I agree with what you just said. And the people that I've talked to said, you know, he, he picks somebody that is, is very similar to him on the issues and has the ability to articulate those positions. And that's exactly what J.D. Vance did last night. You know, I thought that he was extremely clear. For me, he was able to articulate the issues very well. And I know people have a tendency to think, well, the, the person who is uh, articulating my positions or the, is the winner. And certainly that was the case for me. But he exhibited, I thought, uh, very strong comfort in, in his positions. There wasn't hesitation. There wasn't, uh, you know, a lot of uh, backing up or those types of things. And uh, I thought uh, Walsh fit the, the description that you heard uh, Tom Emmer share about him, which is, hey, he's nothing but uh, Gavin Newsom in a flannel shirt, <laughs> because that's uh, that's how he comes across to me. Is he's he is a very very liberal guy, trying not to sound like a very very liberal guy. And uh, JD Vance was genuine, and I, you know, we, when you respond that automatically, that quickly, that that uh, uh, fluid in a fluid fashion like that, you know that you haven't rehearsed those responses. That's uh, just how you feel. And uh, that's how J.D. Vance was. He was very comfortable with his own skin. And I think that he, uh, I think he represented conservatives and, uh, and, and the former president very well. Well, and uh, I know you won't like this, but he was very fulcher like You don't like the compliments just like me. We have that in common. But he was very fulcher like because he was real. He listened. He was respectful. And a lot of people, and again, we, we, you know, who are we to, to say anything about Donald Trump? People love his policy. Sometimes they don't like his behavior. He's the great disruptor. That's who he is. You can't change that. But Vance really offered a very different version of the GOP where here's a guy that worked hard and achieved. And if he could, he could agree to disagree with Wallace. He actually, I think, helped uh, the governor out a couple times. Um, but that whole idea of the compassionate conservative that a lot of folks didn't think existed and that you exemplify. Well, thank you for that. But you're, you're correct in, in the uh, observation. He's approachable. He's a blue collar guy. He was not attacking Walsh. He wasn't attacking on a personal level. And, and, uh, and I think that comes across very good to people. He is a genuine guy. He is one of those people that, you know what, I could, I could go out and have a drink with or have lunch with or whatever and get along and communicate just fine. That is a big deal, and I think it probably is an even bigger deal in this case because of of Donald Trump's mannerisms. He's he doesn't take that approach. He's a bomb basket guy. We all know that. Uh, so to have someone of like mind on the issues be able to take that approach and articulate it the way that he did, yes, I can see why Trump picked Vance. And quite frankly, I got the impression from from that uh, debate last night, that this is a guy who truly could step into the presidency and not miss a beat. And so uh, I think mission accomplished in that sense last night. Our great friend, Congressman Russ Fulcher, joining us. Kevin Miller in the morning, KIDO Talk Radio. Obviously, we'll get to the latest out of Israel, Congressman, and the budget and everything else. But when we take a look at really what's at stake, you've been involved in, again, high-pressure campaign campaigns. It's go time, the future of the nation at stake. What are we going to see in the final days, despite the big money, despite Kamala ads everywhere? It's anybody's ball game. Well, last night I thought that that uh, Vance did a very good job of articulating that uh, this is there's two Kamala Harris's basically, and it's the one that is talking a big game right now and complaining about everything, and then there's the Kamala Harris that hasn't done anything about the things she's complaining of for the last three and a half years. So I think that 
that is it, that resonates with a lot of people. And so whether regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, you have to address that. I think that the campaigns, as we get closer to November, are going to be focused more and more on that. He's going to be more and more defensive and, and more proactive in in uh, trying trying to explain her positions on these things and why flip flops really aren't flip flops. And I think you're going to see the Trump fan side articulate that no, uh, she's she's really done nothing or anything she has done has been negative when it comes to the inflation, when it comes to the economy. So I think that those two perspectives are going to be drilled down on pretty heavily within the next few weeks. And uh, the those who are able to, to get that message out in a convincing fashion, I think, are going to have the biggest the biggest shot at winning some of these swing states. This is going to come down to, as you know, Kevin, it's going to come down to Wisconsin, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Arizona. I mean, that's likely where this is going to um, swing in terms of the election results of those states. Uh, it, it is. And you take a look at, um, and again, you've been outspent on campaigns. The, the it, It's just uh, remarkable that President Trump is right there. And, of course, they always undercount his vote. You take a look at, uh, and one more th- thought about the debates, or unless you want to keep going on this, um, you look at Walls seem to lose his mind, figuratively, not literally, every time that the, the J.D. Vance, Senator Vance, would say something about, uh, the vice president, and he tried to bait Mr. Vance. Walls did about Donald Trump, President Trump. It didn't work, but did you notice that? That he, you know, the strange looks, and he kept getting angry. At least that was my impression when the senator basically said, you know, just as you did, her failed policy. She's had three and a half years. Yeah, and uh, and and Vance did a very good job of that. And you know, I I got the impression that that Waltz was was uh, not only angry, but frustrated. Here's this young guy that is uh, standing across from me who is picking apart my my running mate and doing a very good job of it. And he got frustrated with some of that and didn't know how to respond in a fluid fashion. So, you know, that was very, very evident, at least to me. The other thing about your previous comment, Kevin, I have to agree with the, the Trump Vance campaign has seemingly been omnipresent everywhere. They, they're all over the place. And I think that means something. I've learned that in my own campaigns. When, when you are out there and you are relentlessly in front of people, you're making all the whistle stops. You're talking to big groups. You're talking to small groups. You're talking to people one on one. You and and you're just omnipresent. People want to see that. They want to. They may not want to be with you personally, but they want to know that you're out there working. And I tell you what, uh, this is not for the faint of heart. I've done it on a statewide level, and uh, of course, I don't have the, the resources that these guys have, but. Uh, I can't imagine what it would be on a national scale when you're doing multiple states and it's just a nonstop deal, but it has an impact and these guys are working it. And I think people want to see that work. You know, if if they're out working it this hard on a campaign and they're just absolutely relentless, then there's a really good sign of how you're going to act when you're actually in office and, and you're doing the job. Our great friend, Congressman Russ Fulcher, he's doing his job working for us in Washington right now, talking to us on KIDO Talk Radio. Uh, you're going to love this one. So we've got the longshoremen. They're mad. They're angry. And unfortunately, panic has hit the streets of Meridian. The Meridian Costco sold out of toilet paper yesterday. I think they did over a 1,000 units, at least if we believe the reports on social media. Uh, as I was trying to say to people, it, you know, the, this was day one of the strike. It's going to take a while for supply chain shortages and again not to belittle the, this big labor issue but um i think we have toilet paper for quite some time your thoughts on this massive strike and, and how big a deal it is sir well i'm i'm not the let's just say i'm i'm not the most empathetic towards the some of the union activities and my understanding is is that that they were offered a tremendous increase uh, by ownership and and rejected that and so um, they there was a time 
when uh, I think in this country where it was extremely important to to unionize and to have uh, workers' rights, and and that certainly took place. But somewhere over the last few decades, that pendulum of, of influence swung so dramatically in the other directions. I think that you you unionize something, you take a militant approach to it. It's like anything else, and you can do a tremendous amount of damage. And in this case, it can be a tremendous amount of damage to the American economy and American industry. So um, uh, I think I think Reagan eventually got it right. If you remember, while he handled Patco, the air traffic controllers, and and uh, it was not a pleasant scene, and it was controversial at the time, but he uh, he wound up solving it and. So um, we'll see where that breaks out. You know, back on the toilet paper issue, um, every time I, I hear something like that pop up, I, I can't help but reflect. I believe, Kevin, we have the largest toilet paper manufacturing facility in the world in uh, Lewiston, Idaho. I could be wrong with that. It may not be the biggest, but if not, it's one of them. And so, you know, all this is is really a distribution problem. Maybe, uh, maybe when I get back, we uh, we jump in my Chevy truck and we go up to Lewis <laughs> and we see if we bring back a couple of truckloads of toilet paper and just solve this problem. I, I you know, solving these simple solutions are great. Friend, Coxman Russ Fulcher <laughs> joining us. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny they're they're very arrogant. Uh, the longshoremen and turning down fi- uh, a fifty percent pay increase. They want seventy five. And you're going, you know, we are living in the the Harris-Biden uh, economy. Congressman Fulcher, let's switch gears. Um, obviously, uh, before we get to Israel, uh, the devastation on the East Coast, highways wiped out. Uh, this is going to hurt. Maybe it won't hurt us west of the, the Great River, but it is going to hurt. And again, you, a compassionate conservative, a, a, a proud Christian, a man of faith, uh, I know your prayers, your thoughts, and anything you can do to help those folks. What would you like to say about what uh, the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida are going through right now, sir? Well, we are we are blessed in Idaho because we don't typically have those types of things. But this is actually, I think, uh, going to be exacerbated by this strike. And and uh, I want to make one more comment on the on the strike issue. If you're an owner, and 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 your your uh, workforce is being so in, incredibly unreasonable, what do you do? Well, uh, if history replays itself, and I think it will, they'll just move their operations outside of the country. They'll move it somewhere else. They'll they'll um, uh, put in robots as opposed to having uh, personnel. And they'll automate. They'll invest that direction. And, and quite frankly, uh, they're going to keep on keeping on doing business, but it's going to be less attractive to the American worker when they do it. And, and, the, and this applies to this um, disaster that we're facing in the Southeast. Uh, the supply chain is, is disrupted. That's going to have a impact regardless of what type of relief efforts go in there, whether it's private. I'm seeing some of the Samaritan Purse type organizations when they're having a fabulous impact uh, or it's government, which is uh, FEMA does a pretty good job under the circumstances most of the time. They still have to have a supply chain. And so this is an interrelated problem. I think it's going to be exacerbated now. Frankly, one of the reasons that I'm in D.C. right now is we know that we're going to be dealing with a supplemental uh, uh, appropriation. And so uh, some of us are in place trying to strategize through that and, uh, and making sure that this just doesn't go straight on to the debt, that there's pay-fors and places to, to go within other budgets to, to get those resources without just adding to the debt. But back to the more immediate point, this is a, a, a tragedy, uh, but it is is a, the type of thing that you, you simply can't protect from, and so you know you're going to have these things periodically. And uh, so what, what you do is, is it all hands on deck? And uh, that means the private sector. That means you know, government uh, uh, relief support. That's what we're attempting to do. Prayer could be the most important thing of all uh, with uh, with this all coming down. Yeah, and again, we, we take a look at, uh, again, those folks that are struggling, and then we've got the longshoremen running wild. Speaking of uh, running wild, you've got Hezbollah on the run, Hamas on the run, Iran attacking, uh, attacking Israel, the Houthis getting the the beatdown they deserve. Your thoughts on the Middle East, sir? I have to tell you, this is the most concerning thing in the, uh, on 
on my mind on the world scale scale right now. I, I, I got a reasonably deep briefing yesterday and cannot go into a lot of the detail, but I'll, I'll just tell you, Kevin, on a, on a personal level, this is, this is extremely concerning and it has to do with the uh, direct aggression from Iran uh, into Israel. They typically use their proxies. They use Hamas, they use Hezbollah, they fund them, they arm them, they train them, and then uh, then Hezbollah and Hamas go in and do the dirty work. Now it's Iran directly, plus what's left of Hamas and Hezbollah. And um, it's a, it is a force to be reckoned with, but so is Israel. And Israel is of the mind. They are going to do exactly what they have, have done all along. They are going to protect themselves. And they are going to do whatever they have to do to protect themselves. And uh, it it could be a very, very significant series of events. And that region of the world is so sensitive that um, uh, other countries can get sucked in immediately. And uh, and, and we can have a real chain reaction into, uh, uh, I don't want to say another world war, but there could be a a chain reaction to just make this an explosive series of events. So I'm very concerned about it. I think Israel is going to prevail. Uh, Expect them to be coming to the U S as well, looking for uh, incremental aid. And so you're going to see the Ukraine debate uh, pop back up. You're going to see uh, a Israel debate pop back up. And uh, uh, this is, but this is, potentially historic in a, a uh, not-so-positive way. I'm very concerned about it, but at the same time, very much in support of our allies in Israel and, uh, and need to see them prevail here. Our great friend, Congressman Fulcher, Kevin Miller, KIDO Talk Radio. You know, it's amazing, though, how they're doing it with the, uh, you know, with their hands tied behind their back from the Biden administration where Biden and Harris are slow-rolling the aid, I heard one uh, one report they weren't going to send them tractors to help with the mines. And, of course, the media isn't covering this. And and you know how it is. You Sometimes it's like working in a place. Sometimes you get support. Sometimes you don't. But imagine if President Trump were were running that show. All of a sudden, uh, you know, that thing would have been over by now. Yeah, I think so, too. Or, or it wouldn't have happened in the first place. We have to remember, Kevin, um, we, as in the U.S., were party to this whole thing uh, blowing up. And the reason is, is because it was the Biden administration who took the uh, the sanctions off of Iran and basically directly and indirectly sent Iran a whole bunch of cash. And a, an Iran that is flush with cash is a Iran that is very, very destructive because they use that cash to, to train terrorists, to arm themselves. And uh, and generally do bad things, and uh, this would not have happened if we had different leadership within this this country because we're the source of that cash, and so um, and and even now if we had the the right leadership, it does come out of the executive office. Uh, uh, Congress, of course, is is engaged, but uh, not with the primary responsibility responsibility of these these uh, immediate actions when it comes to uh, uh, foreign policy decisions, that's the executive branch. And, and so uh, this, this administration will continue to, to hedge. This con- administration will continue to be undecisive and indecisiveness in the face of, of uh, 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 catastrophe can be very, very destructive. And that's what I'm afraid that we're seeing play out here and uh, uh, so there are those of us in Congress that are trying to, to urge the administration, look, you've got you to act, you need to act now. And, but uh, we've got the wrong leadership in place, and this is a bad time for that to happen. I would agree. And then we have the, the budgets back and forth. But what is the latest on that, sir? Well, I think we've got it through um, – it's been extended through December 20th, I think, is where, is where the uh, – budget got extended to. I did not support that, by the way. I, I, I wanted to see it extended past the the first of the year. 
so that we wouldn't have the the lame duck budget uh, problem there where you've got a transitionary administration that gets more than one bite of the spending apple. And so I wanted to see that. Plus, I I supported the uh, the version that had the SAVE Act, which would have to mandate that you needed to be exhibit uh, proof of citizenship before you vote. And uh, and that, of course, was, was voted down, not by much, but by enough that it didn't pass. So this was the alternative. So what we've got basically is just a, a Band-Aid where we continue the, the previous spending levels uh, up until December 20th, and we address it again. Then, you know, by then we at least know who the a new uh, the new administration is going to be, and that undoubtedly will have an impact there. But to answer your question, it's a band aid. We we band aided it till December 20th, and uh, uh, we've got to stop doing that. By the way, there's there's too much serious stuff, and it and, and it's an inefficient way to run government because. You know, the Defense Department is a prime example. You've got to be able to plan a little bit. And, uh, uh, and we're basically taking away their ability to, to plan when, when they get uh, just a, a Band-Aid solution as opposed to a long-term solution. So this is, this is a problem. And um, hopefully with the outcome of November 5, we'll have some stronger allies to uh, be able to address this in a more conservative, sane way. Our great friend, Congressman Russ Fulcher, Kevin Miller in the morning, KD, are talking to you. I have to hit you with uh, uh, this one. Uh, and it comes down to using your time since it's go time. And again, in Idaho, you know, it, thankfully, you know, we take competition seriously, but the, the libs are on the run. Let's uh, let's take a look at, uh, at you. And are you helping folks across the country? I'm sure you are. And just how important is the House? And we're not going to get the truth from the libs. So we'll get the truth from you. How do you see the battle for the House and the Senate right now, sir? Well, I'm optimistic, and uh, I think with good reason. And exchanges like last night with the debate front, and and uh, I think how how Vance did bolster the uh, conservative position. But I am I am working with some some colleagues that are in uh, neighboring areas that are that are uh, uh, in having real real uh, struggles to try to get there. I'm, I'm attempting to take care of my own responsibilities uh, as well because you can never take that for granted. I believe that we're going to see a small, when I say we, I'm talking about the conservative Republican side on the House, is going to see a small gain in numbers. It's not going to be dramatic, dramatic, but right now it looks like uh, between four and six seats net uh, addition to what we have now, which doesn't sound like a lot, but compared to the net two, which is what we've we're dealing with here, uh, it, it's a big deal. So uh, we think we're going to have that. It appears like there's going to be a very small uh, margin on behalf of the conservative Republican side on the on the Senate, uh, less than what we would get in the House, but nevertheless uh, enough to uh, uh, to potentially put in the majority. And that is such a big deal because. Even if you don't have uh, a lot of the numbers uh, to give you that pad um, with the margins, if you're in the majority, you set the agenda, and that is so important. So um, I think that would be monumental to get that. Uh, of course, with uh, the White House, I think, I think there's going to be a Trump victory there. I am concerned about uh, his safety. I am concerned about some of the voting practices that are, made, are still being employed. I, I think uh, Georgia is, is having to go through manual counts, if I, if I recall correctly. That's going to be extremely cumbersome. But, hey, uh, the bottom line is I think it's pointed in the right direction, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm optimistic with the outcome, Kevin. I think it's, I think it's going to be a good night. I think we're going to have a, a different world we wake up on, on November 6th. Our great friend, Congressman Fulcher, Kevin Mill in the morning, KIDO Talk Radio. Congressman, uh, we've kept you extra long. Anything else that you would like to share with us today, sir? Well, uh, once again, I always try to use the the uh, uh, the point that let's be thankful where we are. We're in, in the great state of Idaho, and, and uh, we've, we've certainly got our challenges, but... You know what? Uh, there's a reason why neighboring states want to become of our become part of our state, and uh, and and so just like you do on a routine basis, I want to just remind everyone within earshot of 
welcome to Idaho. Now, don't forget why you came here, because uh, you came here for a reason. You came here because it's a better place than where you left. And I'm talking to the new people coming in. And, uh, and, and raise that awareness. Now, that, now, now that you're here, don't try to turn us into where you came from. Uh, you know, we, this is a, this is an oasis, uh, comparatively speaking to a lot of the, the country that stands for the family values and, and the tra- traditional principles of our founders. And so, uh, that's a, a message to, to anyone within earshot who is relatively new to the state. Welcome to Idaho. Don't forget why you came here. Congressman Fulcher, we t- appreciate you. You have a great day, sir. Good luck in the, in the swamp. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate you. Take care. Take care. Our great friend, Congressman Fulcher. We'll get your reaction next. Kevin Mill in the morning, KIDO Talk Radio. Phone number is here, 580-5436-580-KIDO. Political career. Did you change your position? Why? Yeah, I sat in that office with those Sandy Hook parents. I've become friends with school shooters. I've, I've become friends with school shooters. Did you change your position? Why? Yeah, I sat in that office with those Sandy Hook parents. I've become friends with school shooters. I've, I've become friends with school shooters. There he is, the governor of Minnesota. Good morning once again, friends, true believers, evildoers beware. K. Millie and the crew, 580-5436 on Idaho's talk station. K.I.D.O. Talk Radio. So here we have Minnesota Waltz. And if you watched that thing last night, if you listened to it, the facial expressions were worth the watch. Waltz looked angry. In fact, every time J.D. Vance said something about Kamala he got mad, and he tried to bait him about Donald Trump. And quite frankly, Vance seemed like the mature 60-year-old, and Walls seemed like the immature 30-ish something. It was a role reversal. But again, imagine if J.D. Vance had said this, I've become friends with school shooters, and he wasn't corrected. Man, it's so much we blew out the sound on that thing. Let me try it again. Wow. Parents, I've become friends with school shooters. I've seen it. Look, the NRA, I was an NRA guy for a long time. They used to teach gun safety. I'm of an age where my shotgun was in my car so I could pheasant hunt after football practice. That's not where we live today. There we have it. I've become friends with school shooters. One of the many examples of Minnesota Waltz stepping on everybody's shoes, stepping on the feet. By the way, again, he was asked about being at Tiananmen Square. Remember, Waltzy likes to lie, and he was caught. He was caught by the reporters who did their very best to try to derail our real-life American hero, J.D. Vance. 580-5436-580-K-I-D-O. We'll talk more about that. The liberals, they were upset. They were whining. They were crying. They were saving themselves... Why didn't Minnesota Waltz do something good, Kevin Miller? I mean, I think there was a clear lack of preparation and execution here on Waltz. I think actually it's the opposite. I think he had too much preparation. Maybe, He had so many lines that he was clearly trying to say that he didn't listen and said when... when, uh... What great analysis here by the CNN pundits. They They were a group of folks that had to do nothing but drink sour grapes. Melon faces just... Just very sour and bitter last night because the good guy won. J.D. Vance said one of the many, many things he um, really hit Kamala Harris on, not Tim Walls, but Kamala Harris. He didn't respond because he clearly had things in his mind. I think the lack of interviews that he has done with national media, with local media, it showed. He needed more rest. There, There it is. The example is he failed because he didn't hang out with us. What's, what's he need? More of me. There we have it. Uh, speaking of more, if you haven't heard yet, October is Cash for Cars Month at our friends at Team Mazda in the pre-owned superstore. If you've got a car that you're willing to sell, take it to Team Mazda and get free cash and a trade quote from Aaron and Joel. Selling your car to Team is so much easier than selling it yourself. You drive to Team. If you agree to their cash offer, they cut you a check and they take care of the title transfer and everything. It's super easy. And yes, they will pay you as much as you, uh, you'd you get selling it yourself, even more. And don't worry if your car needs maintenance or repairs. Since Team has their own service department, it's an easy fix for them to fix it up before they put it in the used car lot. 
Now, if you're looking for a trade for your old car for a new one, only team offers the following two trade guarantees. 130% of book value or a $2,000 minimum for push, pull, drag, or clunkers. Whether you want to sell for cash or trade for new, get a free new obligation quote from team before you agree to any other offer. It's Cash for Cars Month at Team Mazda, the pre-owned superstore on the boulevard or online at GoTeamMazda.com. Please tell them Kevin Miller sent you. Love those folks at Team. Kevin Miller on your home for Fox News, KIDO Talk Radio. Bill in the morning, getting your debate reaction. Glenn in Napa. Good morning, Glenn. Good morning, Kevin. You know, you really can't blame Tim Waltz for saying that he was friends with uh, school shooters. Sometimes you just have to blame the mics. <laughs> That was just unreal watching last night. You know, he's like, you don't want to stigmatize people that have mental health issues. Sometimes the problem is just the guns. Really? That just, that logic doesn't fly. Not at all. Next, he's going to blame lynchings on the rope. Crazy town. Crazy town last Crazy night. Crazy town. They're so- and the, you, you're 100% right. The expressions... On their faces. Half the time it looked like Walt had been sucking on a lemon. And then, uh, man, the memes you can make with the faces that Vance was making. Well, Vance was actually uh, trying to, you know, Vance was trying to be compassionate and understand Minnesota Waltz. And it was funny because... He was even trying to help him. Yeah, and I'm going, dude, you don't need to help that guy, number one. And number two, it was weird because Vance was legitimately trying to uh, be a person and Waltz went to the Kamala playbook where they were trying to bait him about Donald Trump. He goes, look, you can say what you want about Donald Trump, but that's why people love his economy. And, and every time he would say something about the vice president, it, you could tell that Waltz got mad. And, and, and Waltz was like that. He, he, he was like that guy that, you know, took a lot of Metamucil and is still constipated. <laughs> he doesn't oh, know what yeah. to do next. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was just uh, quite entertaining to watch. If you didn't watch it, you missed a lot. Yeah, no, it's incredible. So, uh, you know, P- CBS is saying he barely won. But look, the moderators, when he goes, I loved when J.D. Vance said, no, Margaret, we agreed that there would be no fact-checking, so I'm going to fact-check you. And they kept trying to cut him off, and they exposed themselves, and then they – were cutting off his mic, and he was still right. They didn't know what to do, and the guy did it, and it's not an easy thing to do without losing your cool. He was he was rolling, and, and it, did you notice when every time J.D. Vance would smack Waltz, uh, Governor, what do you say? But when Waltz would do the cheap shots, they, they tried to disrupt Vance. Yeah, you could definitely tell it was slanted. There were a lot of questions that probably shouldn't have been asked or should have been asked that weren't. I think they should have asked Walt if he had misspoke when he said that he retired as command sergeant major uh, with the whole stolen valor accusations. I think that should have been brought up because it has to do with character. Um, well, well, here's another one. Yeah. Evan Brown, who we used to have on all the time, but Evan's a little dry even for us. He pointed this out last night on X. He said, Donald Trump has been... Uh, the target of two assassination attempts. They don't bring in that up. They don't bring up Ukraine, but they bring up January 6th. I I think also they should have brought up when uh, Netanyahu came to visit and uh, he was ghosted at the airport by all the high officials. Yeah. You know, nobody went to show up when he came in. They left some underlings to do it. And uh, when he spoke... In front of Congress, none of them showed up to hear him speak. Well, you got to you know, like Kamala should have been there. You got to give it to Netanyahu though, because what we've read from the Wall Street Journal is he had approved the strike, and he knew they were getting that uh, mullah, even as he was telling those people, "You're going to pay." Then he did his speech and got the heck out of Dodge. Now you talk about cool and calculating. That's Netanyahu. Oh, you don't want to mess with Israel, that's for sure. You look what they did with the pagers, you know, that's targeted strike. Um, that's just brilliant. 
because really they're going to be afraid of all electronics now going forward. Is this safe? Is it going to blow up? You know, they're just from a psychological standpoint, that's just priceless. No, you're right. Anything else you'd like to share, Glenn? No, I think I'm good. Thanks for the time, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, bless you. 580-5436. How bad was Minnesota Waltz on KIDO Talk Radio? Well, I think it was something that the team working with Donald Trump had hoped he had done during the presidential debate it, more than he did. Uh, J.D. Vance did it repeatedly tonight, yeah. saying, listen, she's had nearly four years to do that as vice president. Why hasn't she? I feel like that was really effective. But I think overall tonight, if you're an undecided voter in America, I don't know that you come away with tonight uh, with an additional clarity. Uh, it kind of reminded me of the June 27th debate uh, when Kamala Harris that night said of Joe Biden, it was a slow start, but a strong finish. And that's how I felt that Tim Walls kind of uh, did tonight. You know, to use uh, Tim Walls' own words, I mean, a lot about this debate tonight was was weird. There were uncomfortable, cringy moments, but... Yeah, he was uncomfortable comfortable and he was weird and of course this lady that one of the debate moderators from abc is not going to give jd vance the victory in fact there was only one person on abc liberal 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 abc anything associated with the abc they're liberals they know it they're not fox news there was only one liberal abc commentator that basically called it like it was a great night, a great night for the Trump campaign. We'll tell you who that was next. Kevin Miller on your home for Hannity, KIDO Talk Radio. Hannity. Kevin Miller in the morning, KIDO Talk Radio. Phone number is 580-5436, 580-KIDO. Let's go to Nicole in Emmett. Nicole, good morning. Good morning. Just 10 seconds. I have a nickname for Tim Walls. Sure. And if you can visualize it, you'll totally understand it. We got Teletubby Tim. <laughs> Teletubby that's, Tim. That's a great one. Uh, Nicole, good luck on the roads today, young lady. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Teletubby Tim. Boy, that is, that is, uh, that is something you'll only hear here. Phone numbers here, 580-5436-580-KIDO. Appreciate everybody calling in. As we move along, we would love to hear from you as we uh, take your calls about the issues that matter to you. Let's go back to the phones. Kevin Mill in the morning at KIDO Talk Radio. We'll go to Polly in Napa. Good morning, Polly. Good morning, or should I say good afternoon? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, we got those cards back, Nick, and he split the other day. And uh, we'll be doing it again pretty soon. That uh, shuttle that we were talking about. Yes, at Team Mazda, yeah. right. Right. And then today's the, the big day, the auction day. And uh, so we got that going for us. But, you know, last night's debate was not, it was, I wouldn't say it was lackluster. But they didn't build it up as far as I'm concerned as, as to good as it was. Um, there was there wasn't a lot of talk over the top of somebody else. Like most time, you get a Dem and a Republican in, in the same room, and the Dem has to start yelling over the top of what you're trying to say at the same time, and it just it doesn't work out well. And, and we didn't have very much of that last night. And, and uh, what we did see was. And here was uh, uh, basically a college professor in J.D. Vance, school, a little schoolboy that didn't know what he was talking about with a tampon cam. And, you know, I just, I'm, I'm in amazement sometimes at, at some people, they get, they get a lot of power such as, as the the uh, governor of Minnesota, and they want more. And, and it was evident to me last night. I said, I don't think the reason why he went to Tiananmen Square in China 30 times was to take school kids there. I'm not really sure of, of the exact reason why he decided to do that 30 tripper, but something just doesn't seem right with the guy. And... uh I feel as though 
he, he, he and both he and Kamala have something that they have to hide, and they don't want to let us know. But they'll they'll let us know in no uncertain terms if they get if they get elected. And I think once again, if you're listening to this on Kevin's radio or on his station, you got to take into account what what their agenda is. Um. I think everybody's got a misconstrued idea of what Trump wants, that he's in it for himself. I don't believe that. Um, he's, he's got too many kids. He's got too many things that he's... He, he, too much responsibility. And, and he, he enjoys being a president of the United States because he's helping us. And... Um, I don't. I don't know what this this thing called Trump derangement syndrome really is. Or great to have a good night in the debate. It's great to have a uh, wonderful appearance that the liberals can't take away from us. You got the liberals that you know they're saying to themselves, "Oh, let's face it, uh, Walls did well. He 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 said he's friends with school shooters. How bad is it? By the way, speaking of how bad things are." Our latest article, yeah, Kevin, <laughs> it is bad. You call that writing? Yeah, you're right about that. Anyway, uh, a couple of good headlines here. Why the Mountain West is done without Boise State. Really, there's no reason to tune into the Mountain West. And we expose the great Idaho toilet paper shortage. Can you believe that? Costco out of toilet paper yesterday because they're afraid of the longshoremen. Amazing. Our great friend, political consultant, political analyst, the guru of all things political in Idaho, our great friend Mike Tracy joins us. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Kevin. <clears throat> when I heard you laughing there at the very beginning, I thought, wow, he's laughing at me already, and I didn't even say anything. So I appreciate <laughs> being on with you, Kevin. <laughs> no, we, we love uh, having you on, Mike. And you've been involved in politics and broadcasting for over 50 years in Idaho. Why did, did that profession choose you, or did you choose it? That's that's a good question. It it really chose me. I was doing some being you know volunteered to be a disc jockey um, it, 50 years ago this year, and uh, started doing news very quickly after that. And uh, I, I loved doing it. And then they started paying me money for something I loved to do, and I changed majors over to uh, communication, mass communication. Uh, and it, it's, I've been with it ever since. And, uh, in some form or fashion, I've been involved in radio or television or, or, or something along those lines. And so I've been at it a long time and, uh, the experience has been great. And, uh, when I'm able to bestow that on others, you know, and, and help others, I, I do the best that I can to help them. So it's been, it's been a good run. It really has. And I, you know, it's not over yet. I still uh, like to work with people. I still, uh, still willing to help people that need the help. So, um, you know, I, I get calls from time to time and, and get hired to do things. And so, I'm always I'm always on on hand if somebody needs to get a hold of me. Well, Mike, again, uh, what if people want to get a hold of you about an issue or consulting or advertising what can they do and let, let's get the website because i know you give out the number and we're, you and i are so old school that way but probably the website's the easiest way to remember so you're i was going to say your name and number it's not on the wall it's on the air but uh if people want to get a hold of you sir yeah just go to tracyconsulting.com that works for me now see even i can remember that so I'm, I'm good yeah that's an easy one <laughs> so mike uh You've been involved in these things at the highest levels with Senator Craig and others, what, you know, preparing people for big debates, uh, a lot's at stake. What did you make of last night's debate? What did what did you see that most of us missed, sir? Well, I, I tell you what, J.D.'s uh, work at, at uh, Ohio State and Yale really prepared him for, for last night. And all the interviews he's been doing over the last two or three months – since Trump named him his vice presidential pick, he was sharp as a tack, and he he devastated Tim. He, he, just, he just devastated him. It was not even close. Uh, he was all substance and no no fat, all 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 steak. It was uh, pretty amazing to watch, and he was 
he just focused on policy and you know there were they had disagreements it, it was you know they were they didn't get disagreeable which i thought was a real plus they didn't they weren't attacking each other and that's that gets old for a lot of people they really kept it at a pretty high level overall but tim was uh, or I should say, uh, JD was really uh, on message. He was he knew exactly what he wanted to say about each issue. It was really kind of again three to one. The the two narr- or moderators along with uh, Tim Waltz were you know, ganging up against him, and he handled that extremely well. Um, even even better than in some ways than Trump does. It it was amazing to watch that, especially when he was. Line out, lining out a detail of a bill that Tim Walt signed, and Tim didn't even know the, what was in the bill. J.D. knew what was in the bill because he knew he'd probably get asked about it. So he, he did his research, and he knew exactly where this thing was and what part of the document. I mean, that just shows a, a very high level of intelligence and a, a someone who knows how to prepare not only for debates, but the really are really need to have the ability to take their mind and work really hard on these difficult problems that now faces. He's going to be a good, uh, not only a good running mate, but he's going to be a good vice president to uh, President Trump to uh, be in a, a really strong assistance to him on, on a lot of these policy decisions. Well, how difficult is it, Mike? Now, again, you've been a journalist, you've been a political consultant, you've been a candidate. How difficult is it with the bright lights on to be out there with no audience, with two adversarial moderators that are helping the other guy to be as cool, calm, and collected as J.D. Vance was yesterday? Well, it is it is difficult, and that's why I was saying that he handled them extremely well. Um, I I remember I was pre- uh, prepping Senator Craig for one debate on Idaho Public Television, um, and uh, you know we knew the moderators were not going to be kind to him, and they weren't. Uh, but they weren't uh, they were not as uh, brash about going after him as I thought they might be, because they didn't they didn't like Larry Craig because he was a conservative Christian Republican, and when you're all three. Boy, that's that's the uh, the death sentence from the from the left and from the media, and Larry is all three. And in spite of that, he handled them extremely well. It's it is difficult, but if you stay on message and you stay focused, you know you can you can work through any of those kinds of things. And if you just lead with facts and don't get tied up in in all the uh, all, all the uh, disagreeable talk. Then, then you can be on really sound footing, and you're gonna you're gonna be able to uh, handle the situation better if you go from that standpoint, from handling things and giving things, uh, giving things to uh, pol- not only policy, but the questions that are asked. Focus on those, and then focus on anything else you need to. And that's what uh, J.D. Vance did last night. Our great friend Mike Tracy joining us. Kevin Miller in the morning, Cadio Talk Radio. Hey, Mike, what's the name of your website again? It is tracyconsulting.com. Okay, tracyconsulting.com. See, that's the, and you know this, being an old radio guy, It's I have to get that in so I can say that. It's all about frequency. So tracyconsulting doc, tracyconsulting.com. What, did, what about if you were advising um, Walls, uh, Mr. Walls, Governor Walls, uh, what would you say to him? And can you tell us, I mean, he said, quote, I'm a knucklehead. He said uh, he's friends with school shooters. He got caught lying about China. So you're doing the spin cycle. You're doing the damage control. Give us your thoughts on, on Governor Walls. Well, uh, fortunately, I've never had to work with a knucklehead. <laughs> and and at least not in, in politics, uh, I've always worked with Republicans. And, you know, I, I I don't know how I would handle someone like that. First of all, he seemed extremely nervous. And, you know, you, you know that's hard enough to work around. But if, if you can get him calmed down, 
maybe he needs a sedative before he goes on air. I mean, uh, he was he was re- he was shaking there at the beginning, and trying to get him relaxed would have been the most important thing before he goes out there and just breathe and get through the information. He should have had plenty of time to prepare. Uh, he knew this has been coming up for three or four weeks, and he is. You know, he didn't seem prepared. He seemed to stumble stumble around his words, and he seemed to stu- stumble around his own policy. So, I don't know, uh, you know, who is doing his debate prep, but he seemed ill prepared for any kind of combat with JD Vance because JD just tore him a new one, and it was. It was something to behold. J.D.'s probably the best uh, VP debater that I have ever seen, and he's he's one of the smartest guys I've seen either at president or vice president doing a debate. He's, he is a real pro. You know, you're going to love this being old school. Tim Walls reminded me of Admiral Stockdale back in the day. <laughs> Admiral Stockdale. Remember, yeah. remember that from yeah. – uh, the debate with uh, with Dan Quayle, and I don't even know why I'm here. I'm uh, blah, 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 and you're like, whoa. But Stockdale, uh, kids, you should Google that debate performance. Mike Tracy, yeah, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mike. No, I was just going to say I haven't heard that name in a long time. Yeah, um, but it was one of the more unusual ones. So now it doesn't look like, well, let me ask the the, the our political expert here on KDO Talk Radio, Mike Tracy, do you expect, we'll put you on the spot here, do you expect another debate considering, despite the ads, despite the, the negative publicity, despite everything else, it's anybody's ball game in the battleground states? Well, I, I suspect there won't be another debate. Um, you know, it's, it is, I, I, I don't think they want to take a chance, especially with uh, Tim Waltz, I don't think they want to take a chance on him again because uh, J.D. just really wiped the floor with him. Uh, and I don't know that Trump's going to want to do another one because he can't get a fair shake uh, unless it was on Fox. If he could get them to commit to do one on Fox, where at least it would be balanced. I mean, come, if, come on, folks. Just give us a balanced uh, moderator team. That's, that's all we're asking for. And we didn't get that from CBS or ABC. ABC was much worse, but CBS still was doing fact-checking, and they said they weren't going to. So I don't think there's going to be another one because uh, Tim Waltz, is not, his team is not going to let him. Um, and uh, I think unless Trump can get Fox News to do it uh, very, very quickly in the next week or two, uh, it's not. there's not going to be time for it. So, I, no, I don't think there's going to be another debate. All right, Mike Tracy, we're going to put you on the spot again. That's what we like okay. to do. That's how we show our affection. Uh, All right. As someone who, uh, you know, you've had to be the scout team sometimes and, and you know, take a look at the liberals and what they're up to, tell us your thoughts on the Harris campaign. She should be winning. She's on every commercial, every social media. She's doing the Mike Tracy, the Mike Tracy consulting playbook. She's on the social media. You go on YouTube and there she is cackling. She's She's got the media at her back and she's not breaking away. What's wh- Why is that, sir? Well, I think the big part of it is the the Democrat Party is and her base of the Democrat base of voters is uh, well entrenched. The Trump base of voters, which I think is a little bit bigger than the Harris uh, voter group, uh, Trump's uh, voter team and group out there, that base, uh, people who are going to vote for Trump no matter what is is uh, in, in place. And so it's a very small, you know, group of people in the middle that are going to decide this. And I think there's a lot of different things that are going to affect that. I think you've got the the, uh, the black community, the Hispanic community, the Jewish community, all of those all of those groups, uh, unions, union members, are all leaning toward Trump uh, more than they have and in, 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 with any Republican in the past. And I think that's going to do enough damage with uh, those in the middle that Trump's going to pull this out. Well, and, and that's the thing. You look at the economy, and uh, uh, Mike Tracy is a lifelong Republican. We've never had a candidate 
that is doing so well in the Hispanic community, the black community, specifically with black males. What do you make of that? Well, um, I think it's the reason Donald Trump uh, 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 does really well with them is because uh, he reaches out to everybody. Everybody is welcome under Dr- Donald Trump's tent. And you see that. You saw that in the White House. He had a diverse group of people coming into the White House, working with him on a number of projects. You saw him, the, you saw black and Hispanic um, unemployment down to its lowest point ever in, in the last 50 years. And small business creation within the black and Hispanic community uh, was was spiking and doing extremely well with Trump under the Trump administration. And that all disappeared with uh, with Biden and Harris. And there's no reason that uh, people shouldn't just give Donald Trump a chance. That's what he is saying to people. Hey, give me a chance. What do you got to lose? You already had these guys for four years and they didn't deliver. And I think that that's the big thing. A lot of these uh, different communities are saying, you know, Donald Trump doesn't look look at us uh, as, you know, one group. He looks at us as individual people, and that's how he treats us. And I think that it's, it's that more than anything. Mike Tracy joining us here. Kevin Mill in the morning, KIDO Talk Radio. So, Mike, let's move on to uh, Idaho. And let's move on to Where do you see us? We've got the signs being ripped up. That's no big deal. That happens all the time, unfortunately. We've got the ranked choice voting. We have a movement by the Idaho Republican Party where they're recording X feeds. And you can see Representative Crane. I think both Representative Cranes. You could see Mike Moyle. You could see prominent conservatives educating the public about this ranked choice voting. Do you think that's an effective strategy? And why are they doing it, sir? Well... You know, ranked choice voting, first of all, one of the things that's going to, it may hurt or help, is that that that, uh, particular ballot item is going to be at the tail end of probably a four-page ballot. Uh, Presidential years have got notoriously long ballot, um, uh, the ballot, and so that's going to be at the tail end of, uh, it'll probably be a four-page ballot um because uh, i've seen those plenty in uh, presidential election years but you know this this uh fair elections uh, group that says that it, we have to have uh, the well what am i trying to say let me let me step back the fair elections folks that are promoting uh this uh ballot initiative are having a hard time getting the message out. Uh, and that's, I've actually had people ask me how they should vote on this. And that's been, to me, a real eye opener because the Idaho Fair elections uh, folks are really worried about it. And so are the other groups. And uh, people are just hearing one message and it's coming from out of state. And I think that that's really uh, one of the things that really bothers me. And, and we have talked about this, Kevin, that out-of-state money is having an undue influence on the state of Idaho. And that's really frustrating for for us who have been doing this for a long time. There's always there's always out-of-state money that comes in for these kinds of things. But in this case, there's a lot of money coming from outside the state and not enough money coming in the state that is on our side, which is vote no on that uh, particular proposition. So, you know, from... From my perspective, uh, you know, less money coming from out of state is better, but it's always going to come from out of state on these on these kinds of uh, propositions, constitutional amendments, whatever it might be. And in this particular case, this is a bad one where they gathered the signatures. Now, people don't know what they're voting for, and, and they think that what they're getting. Uh, I saw a television spot the other day, and I saw all the different faces they had on there. I wonder if they were even Idahoans that they put on the screen, uh, or they were just uh, people who lent their image to uh, to, to uh, the producers of the the spot. And you know, you can get those images uh, off a number of websites, and that 
that was the thing that struck me when I was watching that. These were normal Idahoans. They, they, they could have been somebody that's not even from Idaho. And that's kind of, those are some of the things that jump out at me as I look at this. Um, and, and Idaho fair elections, go to that uh, particular website. You can see all the reasons that, uh, that this election, uh, really sh- on that particular, uh, uh, that particular issue should vote no. And, you know, I'm strongly supportive of that. So yeah. anyway, that's that's really all I've got on that issue. No, I'm with you. It's good to see our own friend uh, Jake Ball, who used to work for Senator Crapo, uh, involved in that. And it is a calling, whether it's Jake or Tyler Ricks or, you know, these young guys that stay involved in politics. And they could be doing other things. Obviously, they have families and such, but they, they make that commitment. And it's just such a blessing that uh, that we have those young and not and, and like us, Mike, not so young people that uh, that understand the issues. Now it's fascinating because, and Mike, if you could, you now we go back to term limits and remember, and you know this, you educated us this on the last time they passed term limits, and then the legislature said, "You're not the boss of us; it's not going to happen." I know I'm overly simplifying it, but some people say that if ranked choice voting passes, the legislature could nullify that. Again, I know it's a little off the beaten topic. Um, do you think that could happen? It could. The The Idaho legislature could take that and turn it into something else. They've done it in the past, as you mentioned, on, on a variety of issues. And uh, it, it happens. They can muck it up, uh, which would be uh, which would be my preference. But there's it's going to be a close race on that one, I think. Um but yeah, I, Jake Ball is the one that's uh, one of the people that's heading up this Idaho fair elections, and uh, you know he is he has done a good job in educating people out there. And in addition to that, um, I I have seen the, the legislature. Uh, I remember when uh, we became a we uh, uh, our, our state became a, a right to work state. And uh, that was that was actually enforced, and they did they did change the law, and you know that was that was one that was really a, a big deal, and they they stayed focused on that, and they actually put into into the statute uh, the right to work, uh, and that was almost that was about thirty years ago, so uh, it can happen. Uh, it can go both ways, but I think there's going to be a lot of people in the legislature that are going to not only oppose this, but strongly oppose it and probably ter- muck it up quite a bit. Final thought, Mike Tracy, what happens to the Republican Party if Donald Trump is not successful? What about is it is it back to Romney? Is it uh, J.D. Vance? I, I mean, who, who inherits the Republican Party? Well, it's a good question, Kevin. Um I think there's going to be a, um, a lot of I told you so from the people like Liz Cheney and Dick Cheney uh, and and those Republicans who the the no Trumpers, uh, you know, that's that is that is what the first thing that's going to happen. And then it's going to, the parties could fracture quite a bit right now. It seems pretty galvanized and the anti Trumpers the no Trumpers seem to be small in number. You know, there there's a couple of high profile profile people like I just mentioned, but from my perspective, you know, the party is going to have, have to look inside itself if that does happen. I happen to think that Trump's going to win. I hope he wins. We we can't have four more years of what we had in the last four years. It's it's just what will be devastating to our country, our economy, and our place on the world stage. We cannot afford four more years of Harris and her Biden policies. It it will destroy us. We need to make sure that Donald Trump gets elected. I think Idaho will do its part, but everybody needs to get out there and and vote vote early and uh, you know get your get your ballot tabulated as soon as you can. So that's those are my final thoughts and words of wisdom. We love it, Mike Tracy every week. Uh, finally uh, if people want to get a hold of you, uh, your website again, sir. Uh, TracyConsulting.com. There we have it, TracyConsulting.com for all your political and uh, advertising needs. Mike Tracy, thank you, sir.
Thank you, Kevin. Have a great day. You too. Uh, Mike Tracy makes our week every week here on KIDO Talk Radio. 580-5436-580-KIDO. Gee, what are we going to, to talk about today where you have just uh, the the insanity of what happened last night? Uh, Jonathan Carl of ABC uh, saying the truth. And if you're listening to Fox News, which will have Fox News on, Kevin Miller, we're rolling. Won't you join us? 580-5436-580-KIDO. Phone numbers 580-5436-580-KIDO. It's funny. Even when we do well, the liberals never give us the credit. They never give us the credit. Jonathan Carl, that snarkly, sneakly little liberal from ABC News, accomplished journalist, accomplished writer, but he ain't one of us. He's on with the libs. Like I said, we're Fox News, ABC News, good operation, but you know what they did to Donald Trump and everybody associated with them. So here we have uh, from the postgame coverage, handsome David Murr. Uh, and, you know, a guy should not be able to have that many hair follicles, be that articulate, and to be uh, that cosmetically appealing uh, when you're pitching to Jonathan Carl. With, the you know, Jonathan Carl, like Kevin Miller, the follicles just weren't his blessing genetically. And, you know, he's got the glasses. So you go from uh, handsome David Murr to Jonathan Carl, the everyman. Kind of like Kevin Miller if he were thin. I wish. Anyway, uh, enough of the distractions. Who won the debate, Jonathan Carl? Courtesy of Liberal ABC News. Into this debate. Uh, 90 uh, minutes in yeah, by my count. In, but yeah. it was still quite a moment. Uh, it, it, it was. You know, but but first, David, I, I got to say, I think that, that Walls did seem unsteady. And frankly, what I saw in Walls is somebody who has not faced questions on a national stage since he became the Democratic nominee. He was simply out, out of practice. I mean, they, I don't know why they've done it, but they've kept him uh, out of the limelight. They've kept him away from reporters. They haven't had him do any interviews. And he was clearly unsteady through much of that debate. And in contrast, J.D. Vance was very smooth. He took the arguments not to Walls. He was very respectful of Walls, uh, took it to Kamala Harris. Overall, a tone of civility in this debate, in, in an election that has been anything but civil. I was struck but, on that point, though, John. Repeatedly, both of them said to each other, well, I appreciate what you just yeah. said there, uh, and then went to, to sort of claim their, their separate uh, stances on whatever the issue was in, in the moment. But they said it a number of times in different ways, but both acknowledging the other standing on that stage. Yeah, and, we, and you just don't hear that anymore. And, and, and J.D. Vance did a very good job um, on, on taking the policy questions, including ones that were going to be very difficult for him, and pivoted back to make the points he wanted to make. But at the end of the debate, 90 minutes in, a reminder that this is not a normal election. This is not simply an election that is about policy debates. This is an election that features uh, a, a candidate who is trying to return to office after having refused to accept the defeat in the last election and trying to overturn a Democratic presidential election, something we've never seen. In yes, let's bring that back. January 6th. No uh, presumption of innocence, no regular justice. They had to get desperate because Vance was just making Walls feel the pain. Making him feel the pain. And by the way, it was so bad that the CBS people t tried to jump in there. The CBS people tried to do their very best to help Minnesota Walls, and it didn't work. But I mean, he didn't, like, do the jazz hands or whatever, which he does at a lot of the rallies. That was a step in the right direction from a theatrical perspective. <laughs> Walls, I mean. I don't, I don't understand something. Why is it that, I mean, he's like a serial exaggerator or fabricator of his own personal narrative. He's been asked about it twice, once by Dana Bash, once in this debate. And in both cases, he sort of defaulted to some, like, in, in Dana's case, it was, I don't have good grammar. Tonight, I think he said, you know, uh, well, I'm just a knucklehead. <laughs> Why, why can't you just sort of own up to it? I don't understand. Yeah. I know you said you people no, think I, he's authentic and that, you know, this is just who yeah. he is. But he, he has clearly gone way over the line on his own personal narrative, something that only he would know the facts of. Yeah. And he's done it repeatedly. And when asked about it, effectively, he's just like, well, I'm, I'm no, look, dumb. There are, there are, there I love that. I'm just a knucklehead. I have uh, made friends with school shooters. And I lied about my relationship with China. We're not lying to you when we tell you Beacon Plumbing. We love Beacon Plumbing. Stop freaking. Call Beacon today for all your plumbing needs. Beaconplumbing.net. 
locally owned and operated, manning the phones 24 hours a day, seven days a week, working for you. The great Idaho pay, uh, toilet paper shortage, and if you missed our conversation with Congressman Fulcher, it is true. One of the largest, if not the largest, worldwide manufacturers of toilet paper is in Lewiston, Idaho. We remember this because that factory worked seven days a week, three shifts at a time during the pandemic. And it's funny, you get angry longshoremen and threatening to shut everything down. And there's a run on toilet paper everywhere. In fact, I think Sweet William and I are going to go take a tour of the grocery stores, not every one of them, but those on our list to see whether or not the toilet paper shortage is happening elsewhere. We did have a report. The Costco, I think the Costco in Meridian, which is, I think, the biggest one, the best one, if you will, that uh, they were out of toilet paper. How does that happen? Well, thousands of American dock workers went on strike, slowing down activity at the dozens of U.S. ports. By the way, here's something else that's that's odd as I was explaining to someone, I won't say who it is, Mrs. Miller, uh, that, that it's weird. The two people in my life that uh, said the same thing, Tea Party Bob yesterday saying the same thing, better go buy toilet paper. And I'm thinking, the toilet paper is still in the supply chain. And she goes, better go buy toilet paper. And I'm like, ha. Ah. And yet people are going crazy. How would you like to be a longshoreman? Well, the current offer on the table uh, is pretty good. They want a 77% raise for its 45,000 members over six years. The immediate impacts won't sour the mood for the average consumer yet, but if the walkout persists, a rippling supply chain crisis could boost prices and limit retail stock over the holidays. We did hear they get the, they, everybody got the Christmas items in, but they've been offered a 50% raise. Now, I get what they're trying to do. They want to make sure that they're not taken over by computers or cyborgs, or whatever. And so part of their deal is that our ports cannot modernize. Hmm. Other news, if you want to impress your friends at work, PepsiCo will acquire Mexican-inspired food company Siete Foods. Did I pronounce that correctly? Siete? Siete? Anyway, for $1.2 billion, it's the latest in recent deal-making boom in the packaged food business. People love the snacks. They do love the snacks. Me? Yeah. My physique says that I do love the snacks. We are taking your thoughts over the big debate last night. We all know who won. They will not give us the the the, the due. They're saying that Vance barely won. But from the Washington Free Beacon, not Free Beacon, Bacon as I described it once to uh, Bill Gertz. Tim Waltz had told a lot of whoppers, but the biggest one came on the debate stage last night. When he told J.D. Vance, I've enjoyed this debate, unlikely since Vance delivered the performance many wish Trump could have turned in during the debate with Vice President Harris last month, Vance was prepared, disciplined, and brought every answer back to the fact that Harris has been in office for the past three and a half years. Same old Colts Waltz would benefit from doing more interviews. On the other hand, his performance does explain why Team Harris has been keeping him away from the press. Well, of course. Of course, the guy, they, they know he's a disaster. He's a Teletubby Timmy. In the old days, we used to call liberal Steve Timmy. I think we need to bring back Timmy. Let's, let's bring back old Timmy because, I mean, Timmy last night was an embarrassment. Here you have a, an articulate guy that came in, did a great job. And Timmy, on the other hand, he was frustrated. He looked like he was lost. You know, think about this. When you take a look at Wallace's facial expressions, conveyed a mixture of confusion and sheer terror, especially when asked during his time why he repeatedly lied as recently as 2019 about being in China during the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. By the way, if you grow up in China, the Chinese do not put that in their history books. That's right. The Chinese do not put that in their history books um, because it goes against the narrative. Uh, by the way, what happens when you lie? It's not good for Mr. Walls. I want to ask you about your leadership qualities. Governor Walls, 
You said you were in Hong Kong during the deadly Tiananmen Square protests in the spring of 1989. But Minnesota Public Radio and other media outlets are reporting that you actually didn't travel to Asia until August of that year. Can you explain that discrepancy? Your yeah, comments? well, and to the folks out there who didn't get at the top of this, look, I, uh, I grew up in small rural Nebraska, a uh, town of 400, town that you rode your bike with your buddies till the street lights come on, and I'm proud of that service. I joined the National Guard at 17, worked on family farms, and then I used the GI Bill to become a teacher, passionate about it, a young teacher. Uh, my first year out, I got the opportunity in the summer of 89 uh, to travel to China. 35 years ago, be able to do that. I came back home and then started a program to take young people there. We would take basketball teams, we would take baseball teams, we would take dancers, and we would go back and forth to China. The issue for that was was to try and learn. Now look, my community knows who I am. They saw where I was at. They Look, I, I will be the first to tell you. What the heck is this guy talking about? You lied about China. You lied about being best friends with school shooters, or maybe you didn't. You lied about being deployed as a troop. You lied about being a command sergeant major. Just out yourself and say, I'm a liar. I have poured my heart into my community. I've tried to do the best I can, but I've not been perfect. And I'm a knucklehead at times, but it's always been about that. The I'm a knucklehead at times. Camilla must be so proud. My community, I've tried to do the best I can, but I've not been perfect. And I'm a knucklehead at times, but it's always been about that. Those same people elected me whoa, 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 for 12 whoa. years. And in Congress, I was one of the most bipartisan people working on things like farm bills that we got done, working on veterans benefits. And then the people of Minnesota were able to elect me to governor twice. So look, my commitment has been from the beginning to make sure that I'm there for the people, to make sure that I get this right. I will say more than anything, many times I uh, I will talk a lot, I will get caught up in the rhetoric, um, but being there, the impact it made, the difference it made in my life, I learned a lot about China. I hear the critiques of this. I would make the case that Donald Trump should have come on one of those trips with us. I guarantee you he wouldn't be uh, praising Xi Jinping. Dude, you hung out in China. You went to China every year. You're Jing Jing Ping Ping's little boy. About COVID. And I guarantee you he wouldn't start a trade war that he ends up losing. So this is about trying to understand the world. It's about trying. Sir, why did you lie? Why are you a liar? To do the best you can for your community. And then it's putting yourself out there and letting your folks understand what it is. My commitment, whether it be through teaching, which I was good at, or whether it was being a good soldier or was being a good member of Congress, those are the things that I think are the values that people care about. Governor, just to follow up on that, the question was, can you explain the no, discrepancy? Just, all I said on this was... Can you explain that you said you were in Hong Kong during the Tiananmen Square, not protest, massacre, and you weren't? Governor, answer the question. Governor, tell the truth. Was as I got there that summer and misspoke on this, so I, I will just... That's what I've said. So I was in... Hong Kong and China during the democracy protest went in. And from that, I learned a lot of what needed to be in, in governance. Thank you, Governor. Senator Vance, oh, in my. 2016, you called your... There we have it. Uh, th then they go to, you call your running mate Hitler. How do you come back from that? Uh, who knows? Phone numbers here, 580-5436-580-KIDO. Looking for a lot of things. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, we have a toilet paper update. Kent Goldthorpe, could he be the guru of toilet paper? Forget about buying and selling stock. We're looking at buying and selling toilet paper. He says that Walmart has plenty of toilet paper. Now, I think during the pandemic, we thought we couldn't find toilet paper, but we were going to give away toilet paper. Some people give away money. Some people give away cars. This program, we give you toilet paper. Because let's face it, money is nice and you could buy a lot of rolls with money. Money is great, but let's, I, I mean, when you need toilet paper and there's not a lot of it, it's pretty much invaluable. Nobody wants to get to the place where, you, remember those diapers, they like you reuse the cloth diapers, you wash them and you, yeah, nobody wants, I mean, are we going to get to the point where we're, you know, recycling toilet paper? Oof. <sighs> anyway. 
So if your budget is under 20000 <coughs> pardon, man, that's what I get for trying to be a smart aleck. So if your budget is under $20,000, your, be- your best bet is to go to a good quality used car from a dealership you can trust. Who is that, Kevin Miller? That's our friends at Treasure Valley Subaru. Not only Treasure Valley Subaru, but the Idaho Center pre-owned superstore. That's right, Rob, Jeremy, Juan, Ben, Hank, Steve, Earl, uh, Larry, David, uh, Thelma, Luis, the whole crew at Treasure Valley Subaru. Because when you buy from Rob and his crew, they'll take care of you. They have for me and my family and friends for years. And they always have a very good selection of pre-owned cars under under $20,000. In fact, uh, our, our family has bought a few of those from the Idaho Center pre-owned Superstore. How about a couple of examples, Kevin Miller, for seventeen nine ninety five or less, a 2020 Kia Soul with only 35,000 miles on it, or a really nice 2020 Volkswagen Jetta. Remember when Jettas were the car? Were you ever a Jetta guy? No. Jettas, great car. They even have cars for under $13,000 like these two. A 2016 Ford Edge Titanium. A 2014 Honda CRV. Many of the best under 20K cars sell before they even get listed on the website. So here's what you need to do. I recommend that you go there, walk the lot. By the way, you can go up the little hill there and have a good time. Walk the lot at the Idaho Center pre-owned Superstore at Treasure Valley Super and see what's available today. Treasure Valley Super and the Idaho Center pre-owned Superstore together on one giant lot at the Idaho Center Auto Mall and at TreasureValleySubaru.com. Please tell them Kevin Miller, not Calvin Milner. Kevin Milner sent you. Yeah, trying to do too much today. Let's get back to the great debate, 580-5436, 580-KIDO. Waltz tried to do his very best, saying that people should have a right to go back to Roe v. Wade. And I was watching a debate on Montana Public Television. That's what I do for a good time. Always a pleasure to have you with us. Joining us now, our great friend, Theo Wold. Mr. Wold, how are you? I'm doing well, Kevin. Thanks for having me on this morning. Well, we always appreciate you from the Claremont Institute and, of course, uh, fresh off uh, your appearance a couple weeks ago at the, uh, I believe it was uh, the the Times Square of Idaho, the Crane Creek uh, Country Club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good uh, that's a good moniker for it. Yeah, it was a it was a good event um, as, as always, and a, a good opportunity to speak with um, a lot of uh, familiar faces, but a lot of new faces who have come. Uh, into, into Idaho or are new to Idaho politics who we're, we're looking for information about uh, this Proposition 1 that would uh, totally reorient and uh, transform Idaho's elections from a simple, transparent, first-past-the-post system, the guy or gal with the most votes wins, to um, a, this you know Frankenstein monster created in an, a laboratory at MIT called Rain Choice Voting. Let's talk a little bit about um, what's at stake here. And are you surprised that people uh, are still on the fence about this or need to be informed? You know, um, I, I am and I'm not. And, and here's why. Uh, this is one of the, the great insights of the Democrat Party's focus on reshaping and uh, reconfiguring our election systems, not winning or losing elections, but changing the overall way we vote. They've been at this for about 45 years. And uh, this, this includes everything from, you know, the Motor Voter Registration Act in 1992, which obligates federally funded state agencies or federal agencies to automatically register a voter when they are a recipient of benefits or aid. So that's why a lot of non-citizens or illegal aliens were enrolled on um, voter rolls across the country. Uh, they got they went into a uh, you know a federal agency and got a benefit, and then their name was just automatically added to uh, registration voter registration. So ideas like that to no fault absentee to what's now popular on the West Coast um, all mail ballot elections so that they're just sending a ballot to uh, any name that appears uh, as a registered post office um, 
uh, name. So, you know, you could have four and five ballots sent to a, a residence, whether or not people still live there, whether or not they, they maintain good registration or eligibility to vote. So those are all ideas that Democrats have been at. And I think for most people who work at nine to five, have kids, have a mortgage, you know, coach the little league team who have real lives and are doing real things, they're not thinking through, um, you know, the, the, the particular dynamics of our election system. I think most people just take it for granted that elections are fair, transparent, open, and accountable here in the United States. And then when they get their ballot, they go in and they, they mark the mark the X or fill in the circles. They're not thinking through that, whoa, whoa, whoa what does this mean? You, you're changing the way that we vote. We're now moving to this system where I have to use, you know, advanced game theory to figure out what candidate I like. Um, I, so, so at that level, I understand it. At the other level, I, I think uh, folks have really been deprived of the right information. And, and part of that is, you know, uh, your peers in the media, I, I wouldn't call them your, you know, they're not your colleagues um, <laughs> because they, they're certainly doing something very different than what you do every day. Um, you know, but these folks are purposely, in a lot of ways, hiding the information from Idaho voters, obscuring the real issues and painting the picture uh, that is no way reflective of reality. So when you're looking at the major media outlets in the state, um, they've done a really bad job of putting the information in front of voters so they can make an informed choice. Well, and again, they're always giving one side and not the other. So we've got to get your thoughts on the state of the race. We'll obviously get your thoughts on the debate and uh, your experience in, in that arena. What, what, uh, where, where are we at now as far as the race goes, sir? Yeah, I, I think there's there's just a handful of states now that we're really looking at. And, and some someone might say, oh, well, Theo, we were always just looking at a handful of states. There's about seven states, eight counties. But now I think we're really down to Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania are, are the three big ones. So if, if Trump takes Georgia and North Carolina, the pathway for Kamala Harris to win the presidency narrows to a, almost an infinitesimal degree. Um, if he wins Pennsylvania, it's over. It's, it's over. So for folks who are going to be watching the returns come in on election night or they want to be looking at polling and you know, different events on the ground here in the last 30 days or so, uh, those are the, the big three states. The second tier would be what may or may not occur in Wisconsin and Michigan. I think Michigan is, is a harder reach for, for Donald Trump, um, even though there's that fissure now in this chasm in the Democrat coalition over uh, Kamala Harris and Tim Walz's past support for Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, and then, you know, uh, that sort of siphoning away uh, the support of Jewish voters. But then at the same time, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, Muslim voters in Michigan that are unhappy with, with not having a full-throated opposition to Israeli, uh, you know, ongoing measures to protect their, their sovereignty. So uh, even with all that said, I just don't think Michigan is, is winnable this cycle for, for President Trump. And instead, I, I think that that second tier also includes uh, Nevada, which I think is very winnable for the president and I, I think is trending his way. So, so that's the first tier and the second tier. Now, of course, if President Trump wins uh, Georgia and North Carolina and Pennsylvania, um, you know, he's got the math. He doesn't need Nevada. But once he takes Nevada, you know, you're looking at uh, a pretty massive victory, probably on the scale of something we saw when George H.W. Bush was elected to the presidency in 1988. That that would be the scale of the win. The one thing I'll say, Kevin, that's, that your listeners really need to keep in mind is this is still a jump ball. It it always was and, and is, is a close election. So, for example, uh, most of the polling that shows Trump leading in these key states is within the margin of error. So if it swings the other way, if, if you know Kamala Harris is picking up a three-point win in Georgia and North Carolina, um, she could be looking at a victory, uh, a massive victory of her own, similar to what Barack Obama had in 2008. So um, you know, people who are interested in volunteering and helping out, you know, either campaign. Um, obviously, you know, it's still it's still a winnable election. It's on it's on the razor's edge. And I think uh, voters, you know, a lot of voters will always complain, well, my vote doesn't matter or it's a predetermined outcome. Here's yet another election where that is not true. The outcome is, is definitely still in dispute. Our great friend Theo Wool joining us. Kevin Mill in the morning. Caddy, I'll talk radio. It's hard to believe that that Georgia flipped and is so um, such an issue. Uh, and, and again, the president and Governor Kemp have their issues, but. 
in the end, we should all be uniting. And, and I can't see that Georgia would be allowed to slip away, considering how good a candidate and Governor Brian Kemp has been. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I think uh, I, I hope that the, the narrative that we are dissecting, Kevin, in, in 40 days, you and I, when we look back on the returns is, wow, how did Trump and Kemp bury the hatchet and mobilize that very effective state Republican Party in, in Georgia? Um, alternatively, I think you know, the story will be told exactly as you framed it, which is the disagreements that President Trump and Governor Kemp have had over the years. Um, led to some disunity in the party and a result similar to those U.S. Senate special elections uh, back in, in 2020 where the Democrats you know, picked up two seats in the U.S. Senate with radically leftist candidates that are a total mismatch for the sort of the, you know, the median voter in, in Georgia to say nothing of it being a Republican state. So, the, But the one thing you've got to keep in mind, I think a lot of folks who, are, who follow politics in the Treasure Valley are aware of this, which is that there is an element in Georgia as Atlanta continues to, to grow, and it has a lot of northeastern transplants yep. moving in there, that um, Atlanta really has mutated the dynamics of Georgia. So the map will be all red except for Fulton County, uh, you know, the city of Columbus, where the you know, University of Georgia is located, and a couple of coastal communities like Savannah. Otherwise, it's a red state. That's a dynamic that a lot of states are looking at as urban centers become less and less reflective of the state as a whole. And it's obviously a dynamic we should all be um, thinking through here in Idaho as, as Boise continues to grow and become less and less reflective of places, um, you know, around the state, like uh, in you know, Kootenai County or out east or a place like Power County. They're, 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 they might as well be from different sides of the moon because they just have different views of the world, different priorities, different types of jobs. And that, that's going to be an issue in a place like Georgia and increasingly an issue in a place like Idaho. I'm with you. Our great friend Theo Wold joining us from the Claremont Institute, Kevin Miller, KIDO Talk Radio. And, and again, this is like uh, Kevin Miller, old home day, these three states having lived in Georgia and North Carolina. Now, again, cool. Mr. Wold, you uh, uh, that have dedicated yourself to public service, you remember Senator Jesse Helms. It's hard. Oh, yeah. to, it's hard to believe that North Carolina could be considered a toss-up. And I get Charlotte with the Democrats there in Raleigh, where I used to live. But again, it's tough to believe that North Carolina is a toss-up. Yes, they have Roy Cooper, but he's an old blue dog Democrat governor. So how do you see North Carolina? Yeah, I I mean, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, You know, I'm I'm actually a a big fan of of Jesse Helms. uh, You know, if I had a a political icon, I I think he's he's, um, very emblematic of, of the kind of, of Republican I, I wish we still had in the U.S. Senate. Um, and, and you're right. I think there's a couple of changes that have occurred in North Carolina. The growth of the, the so-called research triangle in, in Raleigh-Durham um, and that area with, with Duke University, North Carolina State, UNC Chapel Hill, that's just exploded and has brought all kinds of big tech and northeastern in, you know, uh, investment money into the state and has really changed the dynamics from being you know, a, you know, a tobacco, rural, agricultural state to now uh, software engineering. And, you know, it's one of the, the highest concentration of H-1B visa holders in, in the country. So it's, it's a different type of North Carolina. North Carolina has also had a lot of northeastern transplants move in, similar to South Carolina, similar to Florida. That's also changed the dynamic. But I think what's really going on here is, is something similar to 2008, where the down ticket races, and this is why candidate quality really matters. Whether people agree with what happened to Mark Robinson, they think it was based on, on uh, you know, truth, and he actually did some of these, these sort of uh, disgusting things, or whether it's made up, it's definitely had an effect. And Mark Robinson, the candidate for governor, by, a Republican candidate for governor in North Carolina, is now running about uh, 17, 18 points behind the Democrat Attorney General of North Carolina. Um, uh, who's, who's, you know, running for governor. So that race is really drawing down the numbers. And I think there's been a lot, a lot of money invested by outside Democrat groups to mobilize young black voters, um, the Northeastern transplants and sort of these PhD, uh, Silicon Valley types who live in the research triangle, yes. uh, to get them out and, and to vote. So that's the dynamic there. Um, and yet, you know, look, uh, Donald Trump remains really popular, even in coastal communities like Wilmington. Um, he's, he's got a strong base there. And I think I really hope that despite the amount of money that Democrats have poured into North Carolina over the last three years, I think it's going to hold. And there were recent projections, Kevin, that really showed that on registration numbers, 
on requests for absentee ballots and um, on moving in and moving out numbers that Republicans are ahead of the mark that they set in 2020 and 2016 uh, when Trump carried the state. So the numbers, the projections are actually better for Trump than they were in those two election cycles. So I think there's a hopeful sign. And we'll see how the dynamics of, of Hurricane Helena uh, play out in the state. I, I will say a lot of folks have highlighted the difference between a good, strong Republican governor like Ron DeSantis and how he responded to multiple catastrophic natural disasters in his state and the missing in action element of Roy Cooper, who has been you know, 10 days without delivering supplies, um, has not been heard from, and his state-run emergency authority has, has been totally absent from the scene. So, I, I, you know, if that story gets out uh, and the devastation and destruction in Asheville and in western North Carolina is seen by lots of voters, um, then, you know, that, that could be a dynamic. Conversely, I will say these kinds of disasters make it harder for ordinary Americans to get to the polls. When you lost your house, your livelihood, and members of maybe in some instances tragically of your family, going and showing up uh, and voting in an election is sometimes the last of your priorities. Yeah. We saw that with the fires in eastern Oregon just a few years ago. So that dynamic, we'll see how that plays out and affects the, the, the trajectory of North Carolina in this election cycle. KIDO Talk Radio. And we'll only spend a few minutes because I'd love to get the last five minutes on the debate and J.D. Vance, uh, Mr. Wold. However, are they really – how how big of a regret are they having not picking Josh Shapiro right now? Oh, I think it's enormous. I, I think it's enormous. I mean, I've, I've seen uh, Governor Shapiro speak um, essentially extemporaneous, off the cuff, a couple of times. He's a pretty charismatic public speaker. He's articulate. And, and, you know, this, this term is bandied about too much, but he is a, a policy wonk. He really likes to get into the details of things. And I think at this point, uh, with how close Pennsylvania is, and despite their efforts to hype Kamala Harris, how asleep a lot of the core constituencies in Philly and Pittsburgh remain, I think they really, really are regretting not choosing him. Yeah, and could you imagine a debate between Vance and Shapiro so let's move on to this, uh, your reaction. Yeah, look, I mean, I think it was a master class uh, for, for J.D. Um, you know, he, he really, he showed what so many um, supporters of his, friends of his, and I've known J.D. for a long time, what we've known about J.D., which is he's articulate, he's relatable, he's, he's actually a very likable guy. It, it really is funny now, right, to think that they spent months um, sort of lampooning J.D. as weird, when most Americans, even some Democrats in focus groups, when they watched the debate, they walked away saying, well, J.D. was articulate, he was relatable, he seemed quite normal. The weird guy on the debate was the dude with the caught in the, you know, the headlights, uh, eyes and the stammering and the explanations that really didn't pass muster on multiple lies. And that was, you know, Tim Walls. He was the one who really seemed kind of nervous and a little off, if you will. Um, and I, I thought that was an interesting dynamic. I also think, um, you know, look, on, on Tim Walls in particular, I, I mean, that moment where he described himself as a knucklehead, excusing away yet another um, kind of nasty lie that he has told was, was sort of shocking. I mean, Kevin, you and I would agree. Like, if you visited 9-11, uh, New York City, sorry, after 9-11, yeah. you wouldn't get you know, the dates wrong and think you were there when 9-11 happened, if you weren't actually in New York. Or, you know, just even recently, you know, a lot of folks in Idaho traveled to Hawaii you know, frequently. If you visited Maui at the week of the fires, you wouldn't misremember the days and say, oh, I was there when it happened if you weren't. So, th that's kind of a big deal. And for the governor, essentially, uh, to be caught once again. So he lied about his military service and his military record. He lied about the bills that he has signed or not signed as governor of Minnesota or the votes he took when he was a member of Congress. And now he's caught lying even about his foreign travel, which he's, you know, he's projected. Some people will say, oh, it's just a, it's just a trip. But no, he used these trips to China to say, well, I know more about foreign policy than J.D. Vance does. And now we, we catch him lying and his excuse is, well, I'm, I'm just a knucklehead. I thought that was, you know, actually fairly shocking um, and, and a real tell about uh, the media's inability to, to really, you know, hold people accountable on the Democrat side. Um, you know, and, and the other thing I think that's really interesting for Idaho voters was that moment when they asked about federal lands and Governor Walls, the governor of a state said, I don't really know anything about federal lands. Um, and J.D. Vance said, 
you know, I do. I don't know as much as my Western Senate colleagues, but I know a lot. And I know the federal government owns too much of Western states. And that's a, a key portion of the growing housing crisis in those states, especially in the West. I thought that was a very telling moment, especially for you know voters in the inner mountain West, like where we are in Idaho, that you've got a guy who essentially says, I'm an eastern governor, uh, midwestern governor, and I, I don't know much about your core issue. Maybe I'll learn on the job. Maybe I won't. Uh, and another guy who says, no, I've thought about this. I've talked to my Senate colleagues who are from your region, and I've got some ideas. So, um, you know, uh, Her- uh, Trump, Trump Vance has a plan for, for fighting the housing crisis. Uh, Harris Walls wants to increase the housing crisis with more illegal aliens and really your, your issues that affect you as a citizen in Idaho. They don't know anything about it. They don't plan to learn anything about it. Okay. Um, what's it like to have someone you know in your age group being so elevated on the national stage, sir? And, and you're no slouch in that department either, but uh, wh- what's that vibe like for you and for the people so in your I, generation? Yeah, two things. Two things. I, I was really proud, you know, because uh, I think millennials get a, a bad rap all the time, and, and I won't argue – uh, with Gen Xers, uh, Kevin Mayu, or, or you know, boomers who, who have or, had or or really bad. Gen Zers like uh, Bo. Look, I've accepted right. you people. You guys are. I, right. I'm all with. I'm all with the millennials now. I was with you all the time. <laughs> no. Right, right. There you go. But you know, so I, I but I won't argue with people who who have had bad experiences with millennials. Who you know, millennials don't show up to work on time or flake out or these things. But I will say that moment was was great to see uh, someone of my generation succeed yeah. and really prove that millennials are ready to lead. There are a lot of, you know, um, old hands steering the, the ship of state here throughout the country, folks who have been in office for 20, 30 years, uh, sometimes longer than I've been alive. You know, folks have, have yeah. held these offices down and their records are not exactly great. You know, they're, they're a mixed bag. And so to see someone like J.D. come on the scene, I think, and do as well as he did. It's not just because he's young. It's not just because, you know, he's young and, and he says cool things. No, he was articulate. He showed mastery of policy. And he also really showed a different element of, of Republican messaging, a, a willingness to accept mistakes of the past and to reach new voters. You know, I'll just tell a quick anecdote. I was talking to a friend of mine. He and his wife just went through a very difficult um, a difficult pregnancy. Uh, it ended in an ectopic um, uh, procedure, the, 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 fetus, the, the unborn child was, was not viable, and um, they had to, to, to sort of square that with their own uh, personal uh, convictions as, as Christians. It was really difficult for them. And, you know, my friend was uh, sort of on the fence about J.D. Vance. He texted me during the debate, and he said, look, I know you probably don't agree with everything he said on his answer on life, Theo, that it probably wasn't as strong as you'd like, but I'll say for a voter like me, and my wife and the situation we're going through, it was nice to hear a Republican reach out to us and say, I understand these are difficult decisions and these are difficult issues that you're confronting. And we as Republicans are willing to hear those and, and to include you in our discussions when we formulate policy. So as a millennial, I was very proud to see that. And, yeah. and I think, you know, the other part of this is just as a, someone who's known J.D. Vance and known what he's capable of, um, I was glad that other Americans, other voters, got to see that on, on clear display as well. Okay, we want to be respectful of your time, so 20 seconds. We'll talk about this next week. Uh, is Tester in trouble? And I don't know if you caught that debate the other night between he and she. I did. I did. He is. And that is such great news for anyone who wants to see real reform in the U.S. Senate and some, some common sense returned uh, to, to you know Western representation. He's in real trouble uh, Tim Sheehy, um, maybe not to the level of, of J.D. Vance masterclass, but certainly um, really called Senator Tester out on a lot of things that he's, he's tried to hide from Montana voters for, for some time now. And it was, it was good to see someone hold Senator Tester to account for his own record. And I, I think Senator Tester is, is, um, is in real trouble, real trouble. Leo Wold, we uh, love having you on. Thank you for taking time to inform us here in Idaho, sir. Hey. Kevin, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Thanks for having me on again. All right. Take care now. All right. All right. There we have it. Our great friend Theo Wold talking about ranked choice voting. Uh, And like I said, it's funny. I I was on a conference call, and it's like I – thankfully, uh, poor Bo, he wasn't even here. I go, dude, I don't even know how to spell Zoom. So I'm on this conference call, and people are saying, well, Kevin, you're an ideologue. You're watching Fox News. I go, no, I I don't. I 
Well, what did you watch? I said, I watched the Washington governor's debate the other night. But I will tell you that you go on YouTube and you watch the Montana Senate debate. And you have John Tester, who is beloved by the people of Idaho, or of, Idaho of, of Montana, because he's a farmer and you know, he is one of those outliers that in a predominantly red state continues to win. And Senator Tester, who has been a friend of ours, uh, Dave Tester, his nephew, friend of ours, um, is in real trouble. The Republicans have targeted him. Donald Trump at the height of his powers couldn't get him. And now you have Tim Sheehy, who's been on with Clay and Buck, who's been on with Sean. Um, the guy is a real life hero, Navy SEAL, pilot. Uh, his wife was in the military. I think he was in the the Navy. She was a Marine. When you're around, and now he's a you know a multimillionaire. You, you get really, you feel like an underachiever around folks like uh, Mr. Sheehy. So they're going back and forth, and you know here's a line. I think we played it the other day where Tim Sheehy on one hand is saying, you know, while you're having your big stakes, I and talking to the lobbyist, I was fighting for America, and then. Senator Tester pulling the old boy, which I love. Well, Tim and his big money friends are trying to buy Montana. It was so relatable to what's going on here in Idaho and the brilliance of this state. And again, what I love about Theo Wold is how he broke down the disagreements between uh, 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 Governor Kemp and Donald Trump. And because there were disagreements, it allowed the libs to get in. And not everybody in the vast a dominant Republican Party get along. And I get that. And you know something? You can be good people. As a consultant said to me, Kevin, you remind me of my first marriage. Two good people that couldn't get along. You don't have to get along, but the last thing we want, the last thing that we want in our beloved state of Idaho, whether you're native or you just got here, is to have the libs. We don't want to turn Idaho into Boise. Sweet William, please write that down. That's a great, great blog topic or article topic, whatever you want to call it. Idaho doesn't deserve to be Boise. Boise, they've mandated, they're going to put in, and I guess the the the, the folks at ACHD, they're useful idiots, and I love ACHD, I love Kent Goldthorpe, but you know the idea that they've ordered the red light cameras, and just like the Empire in Star Wars, dun, 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 dun the red light cameras shall roll into Boise. We'll talk more about that next in Boise style of government versus Idaho style of government. First, Subaru Jerry joins us now on KIDO Talk Radio. Hello, Subaru Jerry. Good morning, Kevin. Hey, you just, I just got in the car and heading to work, and you caught my attention with uh, what you were viewing. You mentioned that you watched the Washington governor's debate. I watched that one, and then I watched the Montana Senate debate. Since we don't have any debates here... I find myself outsourcing my debate watching. Well, yeah, I get that. But, you know, I don't get all those sources to be able to do that. And I assume we're talking about Washington State. Yeah, Washington State. But here's the thing is you can always get those on um, on YouTube. They uh, Like the Montana Senate debate I watched on YouTube. They, they put those oh, up. okay. And that's, well, you know, courtesy like of Montana assessment. Public Television. I'm sorry. Go I, ahead. I, I'd like your assessment of the Washington one. Uh, the Washington debate, I think, again, you have a guy who has, you know, been a congressman there against the current attorney general. And anytime you have a Republican and hopefully that can replace Governor Inslee, I think it's a good deal. Um, it was a lot of funding about education or a lot of talk about education. If I recall correctly, not a lot of cultural issues, but I may be mistaken. It wasn't very well, exciting. It wasn't as exciting as the – look, if you want a, a, an hour of politics um, and you're doing some honeydew lists around the House, Montana Public Television Senate debate, Tester and Sheehy, much superior to anything that I've, I've had. The Washington debate was kind of dry. That's the only thing I can give you, Super Jerry. Okay. So what, what was your opinion of uh, Inslee's adversary? No, Inslee is not running, so it's two newbies. Oh, Inslee is not running. No, no, and, and I think if it were Inslee, it would have been a lot more creative, a lot more compelling, a lot more entertaining. No, Inslee is not not running, so that's what was probably the bo most boring part about it, is you're sitting there going, okay, oh. here's this guy, here's this guy, okay. It was a former congressman against the current attorney general, yeah. 
I get it. But, you know, it's my assessment at Inslee is when I met Walsh on, Walsh on TV, I looked at my wife and I said, there's Inslee. A knucklehead. Yeah. Wait, how... Uh, the major... How, uh, how stupid are the people of Minnesota to elect a knucklehead? Well, how stupid are the people of Washington State to keep Bensley in there for all those years? I agree. People are leaving. You go to Costco and half the license plates are from Washington. And oh, by the way, they're all out of date and they don't buy Idaho ones. I totally agree with you. I think there should be a $100 fine for anyone that is um, in this state without a state plates. And I don't care about, oh, I can't afford it. You could afford to leave here, buddy. Uh, you could afford to change your plates. Quit insulting people. I emailed you a picture my wife took the other day. She was following a car from California. And that plate expired in April of 23. I saw that. What, what's... um. Well, you know, dude, people from California, the bad ones, they make up the rules as they go. And I have to be careful because they always, they always call into Mike Owens and yell at me about, yell at him about me because, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't well, mean that I'm wrong. Can, it means that, uh, you know, uh, have some respect. Well, we can chastise them all we want, but where's the enforcement? I totally agree with you. Where is the enforcement? Where is the, this is where Lee Joe would start insulting the police. <laughs> well, tell Lee Joe we need to get some of these bumps smoothed out of the roads. Well, yes. Now, are you familiar with State Street at all? I rarely get down there, but I know where it is. You're, you're smart. So uh, the brilliant folks, and this is where I'm going to get in trouble with Kent Goldthorpe, but oh well. Uh, at ACHD, they're going to widen the roads, and they're going to do all these crazy things with the bikes, and it's going to be even worse. They're tearing down signs and everything, and you're going, really, guys? Is is this where we're at? Is this the best we can do? No, we should say that for everything. Is this the best we can do? Well, I don't know how they assign their priorities, but they're definitely screwed up. Well, you're right. Hey, I would like to. I'd like to see some red light, running red light enforcement. There goes a Napa cop on a motorcycle right in front of me on 7th and 12th. If he'd sit over here in the Albertson parking lot, he could hand out about 10 red light running tickets in the next hour. Well, note to our friends at the Napa Police Department, if you need to make some money, like a lot of us, we have to make the blog quotas. So uh, if you need to make the quota, that's the hot spot for running red lights. In, in Boise, they're going to have red light cameras. They're going to get rid of the cops to do that. Well, they have those in Washington, too. And I'm telling you, I have a friend who it was driving through Fife, Washington. I don't know if you know where that is, but it's just between Tacoma on the way to Seattle on old Highway 99. And there's a major intersection down there by where the freeway inter interchange is. And there's crosswalks. And I have a friend who stopped for the stoplight. And his bumper was several inches into that white line, and they mailed him a ticket for $275. Oh, yeah. The people of Boise have no idea what they're in for with the red light cameras coming. I had those in Raleigh. We've had those in Oregon. It is not good, yeah. but, uh, you know, there is no dissension in Boise. Nope. Okay, well, that's all I have this morning. Well, we talked you out, did we? That was a long one. I'm, I'm <laughs> beat. <laughs> and then you got to go to work. Subaru Jerry, thank you. Okay, bye, Kevin. Bye-bye, the great Subaru Jerry. Don't forget our friends at Beacon Plumbing. You know what they say at Beacon Plumbing? What's that, Bo? Bo, you know? Bo knows? Oh, I bet Bo's never heard that one before. Uh, stop freaking, call Beacon. Beaconplumbing.net. Water heater goes out. Uh clogged drain, clogged toilet. Oh, no. Call our friends at Beacon Plumbing. Stop freaking. Call Beacon. Please tell them Kevin Miller sent you. KIDO Talk Radio. That's not the people we want. Look, what, what we need is alpha males and alpha females who are going to rip out their own guts, eat them, and ask for seconds. That Those are young men and women that are going to win wars. Uh, please. Please, audience, please. <laughs> 
He's right about the military. That was the Republican Virginia debate candidate Hung Kao, who, by the way, I believe is a great friend of Jeff Katz, our great friend. We need to get uh, Jeff on. Uh, talking about the, the military. Here we have it. I mean, this is what needs to happen where he's talking about uh, we need some people that are ready to roll in the military, right? When, when you're using a uh, you know drag queen to recruit for the Navy, that's not the people we want. Look, what, what we need is alpha males and alpha females who are going to rip out their own guts, eat them, and ask for seconds. That Those are young men and women that are going to win wars. <laughs> well, yeah, you don't really want somebody dressed up like Peter Sellers. And again, you can't relate to this, so sorry. Um, in the Pink Panther. <laughs> the, Hello, boys. Harry in Caldwell with Kevin Miller on KIDO Talk Radio. Harry, thank you for the call and your patience. Hello. Overture, curtain lights. Hello, Harry. Uh, no, this is Harv. Harv. You know, it's what happens, Harv, when I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> My bad. Sorry, Harv. Uh, no problem. Uh, yeah, long-time listener, and uh, this is my second time calling in. But uh, I, uh, I'm i a motorcycle rider, and uh, you're talking about red light runners. And uh, I, uh, Kevin, I about had it with those people. I set, when the light turns green for me to go, I still sit there uh, another 15, 20 seconds until I make sure that cross traffic is stopping and nine times out of ten there's two or three that'll blow a red light and uh you know as far as i'm concerned for a motorcycle rider that's premeditated murder well you have to be very courageous or very crazy to be a motorcycle rider in this place <laughs> yeah i know i hear you but uh you love it and uh sometimes it's uh it's definitely worth the, the risk well going back harv to the red light cameras. Do you believe that uh, that uh, Boise's right with, to do that? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's they can make a bundle of money. In fact, I've talked to a few of the officers here in Caldwell, and uh, uh, you know, I drive all day for a living, and uh, I talked to a few of the officers here in Caldwell and c- kind of complained about the red light runners. And all I get is a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're working on it, and uh, you know. I haven't seen I haven't seen any change, but I'm all for the cameras. Uh, they had them where I came from, and uh, they work. And uh, they, these uh, police departments could make a lot more money if they do that. Well, hopefully, it would stop the idiots that are running the red lights. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I know um, my uh, my ex wife. Got a ticket sent to her in the mail for running a red light. Camera nailed her, and uh, it was not uh, it was not cheap either. No, no, they're not. Um, what's you like living in Caldwell? Is Caldwell good, or <clears throat> your thoughts lately on Caldwell? I know they had to cancel like the dance or something at the school. Yeah, it's uh, well, I don't know. I, I just. Uh, Harv, I don't think right. people are going to know who you are, but, I mean, uh, your answer right there says it all. I mean, look, we don't want to pick on any Treasure Valley City. We want to be welcome everywhere, but the boneheaded move with the the parking meters, the the this, the that, what the heck's going on? Uh, it was, that was a waste of money. They, You know, they put, them in, they put them in, and then, what, a month or two later, they're taking them out because uh, people were sh- not going downtown, and the businesses were... Uh, uh, we're really suffering from it, and uh, well, that it's just you know. very confusing because I went down there and I'm okay. You got to swipe this and wipe that, and uh, are you kidding me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's it's frustrating, but uh, you know, just uh, doing life. That's all. That's all we can do. You know, at this point, and make our voices heard, and uh, for the things we oppose, and. Keep moving forward and hope somebody listens and makes some changes, you know? Yes, that's the idea. Make some changes, improve our lives. Yeah, exactly. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to call in, Kevin. I'm uh, president of your fan club, by the way. Well, thank you. (laughs) Thank you, Harv. I listen to you you every morning. All right, have a great day, and thanks for taking my call. Well, Harv, don't tell anybody, but we got to go to the creek sometime. I love that place. 
Oh yeah, I know it. In fact, I was uh, I was looking possibly to do the lunch with Kevin thing or breakfast. I think it was. I'm not sure what. Uh, it's lunch with Kevin. If you ever get the the you know in Meridian, we could do that at uh, at Harvey's. I owe like three or four people lunches, but I'm definitely into that. If you want to be a part of it, yeah, yeah, I really enjoy sitting down talking to you sometime and having lunch. All right. Well, send me an email, would you, and say it's from Harv. You got it. Thank you, Harv. You take care, brother. All right. All right. Thank you. Have a great day, Kevin. You, you as well. Our the great Harv from Caldwell. Phone numbers here: five eight zero five five eight zero K I D O five eight zero five four three six. You know, uh, again, uh, we're going to go back to the red light cameras. Uh, we do want to talk a little bit about that. Our friend John Delano. Uh, you know, and you know who would be the the, the best journalist to, to interview Kamala here? I don't know. He had a chance to spot, speak Former with her. Pres- Did she uh, ever a- answer a question from KDK Television on KIDO Talk Radio? President Trump says that you've had four years as vice president to do all the things you've promised in the campaign, but haven't done it. Is he right? Or did President Biden not give you or limit it in some way your role as vice president? So let's start with this. Um, I think that the former president is um, is really becoming quite desperate and and is um, has really been um, offering a lot of misstatements and, and misinformation. And perhaps it's because he wants to distract from the fact that he has offered no plan for the American people. Uh, you can, I have talked about this before. I invite you to go to his rallies. And what you'll hear about full time is him talking about himself and his personal grievances. But what you won't hear him talking about is you and the needs that you have as a working person, as a family person. My plan is about building an opportunity economy where I'm going to give first time home buyers a $25,000 down payment assistance so they can get their foot in the door to be able to be a homeowner. My plan is about $6,000 tax deduction for middle class families for the first year of their child's life to help them buy a crib or a car seat. My plan is about getting a $50,000 tax deduction. Giveaway, giveaway, giveaway. Are you kidding me? Giveaway? Somebody's going to pay. Somebody's going to pay. Makes you wonder. 580-5436-580-KIDO. Quick break, then more of you with me next. Stay tuned. Join our club, 580-5436-580-KIDO. It's called the App Yap Club. Uh, Sweet William, can you pull that up? What? You're you're busy? You, what what are you busy doing? Uh, look, we're, we're running a, a real-life organization here. Uh, and it's very unfair to the listening audience because they only hear me. A lot of people say, they go, do you really exist? And that, oh, that's the way you like it. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, let's go to the App Yap Club. Kevin Mill in the morning, KIDO Talk Radio. Uh, as soon as the computer loads, we'll do that. Also, we are talking about red light cameras. The city of Boise has decided in their infinite wisdom to put them in. And I can remember five years ago saying, it's a great idea. They have contracted with ACHD bum 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 to put them in because it's all about safety yes are there a lot of boneheads that do a lot of boneheaded things and drive inappropriately yes but i guess that's why we have a republican not a democracy because they've just arbitrarily done this and then you had mayor mclean going yes it's good Uh, you get your talking points from somebody uh in washington let's see um here we go I saw a car go from my far right lane to the left-hand lane, cutting off a Caldwell cop in the center of the lane yesterday. The cop did absolutely nothing about it. Maybe they were off-duty. Maybe they had bigger things to take care of. It was quite befuddling. Denver in Nampa. Eric and Payette, hey, Kevin, red light cameras at Boise will bleed out the surrounding areas just like California, and that is the beginning of the downward slide to the bottom of the tank. Red light cameras are sneaky liberals and their way of getting into those cities and towns they don't fully agree with the liberal agenda. Because once the red light cameras go in, the money rolls into the blue pocket. The cost of tickets goes up. The bike lanes suddenly start expanding into traffic lanes, which is going to happen on Old State Street. Vehicle registration goes up and so on and so on. Smog certificates will be required and the number of signal lights increase 
And don't forget to ask ACHD when they're going to extend the red light time frames so more traffic lights and traffic tickets get created. Boise and the mayor are 100% cancer for Idaho. Ouch. Hmm. You are witnessing the conversion of the free Idaho with that with at one time is the least regulated state with the nation's governors saying let it happen with the uh, with our governor saying let it happen. Wow. I don't know if the governor could send troops in to Boise. But could Governor Little do that? We're, we're like it would be a 